，主要是因为疫情的。展览非常重要哈，它的题材提到的是智慧跟电动化。那透过这一个平台呢，如果年复一年的办理，就会把台湾这个产业啊，很完整的带到全球。在这次的展览，我们展出了三个东西。第一个是我们的自驾整合解决方案，那第二个呢是我们的车队管理方案，那第三个就是后面看到的我们的自驾车的实车。也很谢谢暴雪这次举办这样子的一个展览，能够让我们这些业界先进的能够在这个展览上面做一些互相的交流以及切磋。大概有跟大概四间左右的买主洽谈，这样。那国家的话，可能有日本，然后有这个越南，然后还有一个是波兰这样。哦，我觉得蛮好的，就是呃，因为透过视讯洽谈会，因为其实主要是因为疫情的关系，可以透过像外贸协会这样子的一个平台。那对我们来说，其实我们也是认识新的客户。有一个很特别的事情是说，就是在波兰这边，因为他跟我们的一些接触比较少，所以他对于说我们可以透过在疫情期间可以透过这样的方式，啊，他觉得。非常的兴奋，也非常感动，甚至像在明年疫情之后，他想要亲自来访台湾。A 食品に全体的には全食品に興味あるんですけども、その中でもあの V2X と呼ばれるあの車と車と物の通信関係ですね、製品。例えば A ダス自動運転ですね。はい。部品とかモジュールとかアンテナ通信のシステムに興味があります。Actually, I met、um, several companies with different.、Um, Focus、um, of this branch in this branch, and I think、um, uh, the Taiwanese companies are well prepared.、Oh. They、um, they developing、um, the market and、um, own product policy on a solid base、uh, because、um, they are、um, working in all directions, like testing, like producing、um, of、uh, different products. 非常的棒，这里聚集了台湾所有的大型的厂商，然后一次让你可以看到所有人的产品，然后一次可以做一个整个完整的各式各样的比较，然后去选择适合自己的。我个人对于之后的电动车和自驾车其实是非常看好的。And Taiwan,、uh, from experience as an engineer, Taiwan has lots of companies which have very high expertise in this sector. They have high technology, good cost and good quality. Actually,预计到2030年，其实整个电动车会占整个乘用车的约莫三成左右。所以其实长线来看，这是一个新的车辆形态的转换。
Taipei MR and Autotronic Taipei. We offer opportunities and inspirations to see the future of auto and motor technology components. Taiwan is an awesome place to find suitable, qualified manufacturers. Epa Show is really, truly the only one show for all the suppliers, all the manufacturers to get together to catch up on the new items to co work for the future. We get really good quality to show how stable that Taiwanese people fit consistent to the whole world. It's good, really, actually, it's good. I just look around here to see what kind of auto parts product for the African people. I actually can find so many interesting products for the Spanish companies. We meet very good suppliers here and very good partners. Now is Taiwan's chance to become a global component supplier. 在电动车的领域上呢，台湾包括像这个散热组件，还有包括充电的呃设施，台湾其实另外一座护国神山正慢慢在形成。几乎所有的厂商呢，基本上都走向 ESG 这个环保的原最高原则的方向了。其实我们在这个 ESG 这方面，其实有一直不断的做努力啦。我们也吸引到很多有关于这样的一个客户，包含一些欧美大厂啊。Also, this time we take advantage of Empower Online, expand the exposure of Taiwan quality to the whole world. Its website design is also very fluid. At home, it can be very fluid to understand the situation in the scene. Now, we want to participate in this live exhibition. It's a good chance for us to look for new suppliers. There's a lot of interesting possibilities to follow up. It's a good marketplace to work Empire is one of the biggest exhibition for auto parts in the world. If you get a chance to come to Taiwan, you got to visit Empire. 我觉得其实看展最有温度就是来到现场，你也可以知道整个产业的节奏。Tronics and the LT Taiwan 2022 will be exhibiting at Nangang Exhibition Center Hall 1 from October 26 to 28 and be held virtually until November 8. These two shows will also be held concurrently with TPCA Show Taipei and Up to Taiwan. Good morning, Coco. Welcome to Syscom. I see that you are with Ned Maker. Please follow me. Our senior director, Max, is waiting for you. Welcome, Welcome to Titanic and ALT Taiwan 2022 show. Please visit us at JO 509A. Hi, everyone. My name is Libby, business development manager of Panasonic Taiwan. You can experience Panasonic's mixed reality system, AMR robotics, solutions and the AI technology at our booth. Can't wait to see you in AIoT Taiwan. This year, for Titronics, we have provided solutions for these three areas. The first one, new energy. We have provided solar power testing solution. And for the second one, automotive electronics, we have provided ISO 16750-2, let's glow. And the last one, battery management system, we have provided charging and discharging for batteries. In addition, there will be many events during the shows this year, such as the IoT Application Forum and procurement meetings. Please register now and see you at the show ground.
展览非常重要哈、哦，它的题材提到的是智慧跟电动化。那透过这一个平台呢，如果年复一年的办理，就会把台湾这个产业啊，很完整的带到全球。在这次的展览，我们展出了三个东西。第一个是我们的自驾整合解决方案，那第二个呢是我们的车队管理方案，那第三个就是后面看到的我们的自驾车的实车。也很谢谢茂协这次举办这样子的一个展览，能够让我们这些业界先进人能够在这个展览上面做一些互相的交流以及切磋。大概有跟大概四间左右的买主洽谈，这样。那国家的话，可能有日本，然后有这个越南，然后还有一个是波兰，这样。我觉得蛮好的，就是呃，因为透过视讯洽谈会，因为其实主要是因为疫情的关系，可以透过像外贸协会这样子的一个平台。那对我们来说，其实我们也是认识新的客户。有一个很特别的事情是说，就是在波兰这边，因为它跟我们的一些接触比较少，所以他对于说可以透过在疫情期间可以透过这样的方式啊，他觉得。非常的兴奋，也非常感动，甚至像在明年疫情之后，他想要亲自来访台湾。電子部品に、全体的には電子部品に興味あるんですけども、その中でも V2X って呼ばれるあの車と車と物の通信関係ですね、製品。あるいは A ダス自動運転ですね。はい。部品とかモジュールとかアンテナ通信のシステムに興味があります。Actually, I met、um, several companies with different.、Um, Focus、um, of this branch in this branch, and I think、um, uh, the Taiwanese companies are well prepared.、Oh. They、um, they developing、um, the market and、um, own product policy on a solid base、uh, because、um, they are、um, working in all directions, like testing, like producing、um, of、uh, different products. 非常的棒，这里聚集了台湾所有的大型的厂商，然后一次让你可以看到所有人的产品，然后一次可以做一个整个完整的各式各样的比较，然后去选择适合自己的。我个人对于之后的电动车和自驾车其实是非常看好的。And Taiwan,、uh, from experience as an engineer, Taiwan has lots of companies which have very high expertise in this sector. They have high technology, good cost and good quality. 其实预计到二零三零年，其实整个电动车会占整个乘用车的约莫三成左右。所以其实长线来看，这是一个新的车辆形态的转换。We offer opportunities and inspirations to see the future of auto and motor technology components. Taiwan is an awesome place to find suitable, qualified manufacturers.
PayPal show is really truly the only one show for all the suppliers, all the manufacturers to get together to catch up on the new items to co work for the future. We get really good quality to show how stable that Taiwanese people get consistent to the whole world. It's good, really, actually, it's good. I just look around here to see what kind of autobots products for us African people. I actually can find so many interesting products for the Spanish companies. We meet very good suppliers here and very good partners. Now is Taiwan's chance to become a global component supplier. 在电动车的领域上呢，台湾包括像这个散热组件，还有包括充电的呃设施，台湾其实另外一座护国神山正慢慢在形成。几乎所有的厂商呢，基本上都走向 ESG 这个环保的原最高原则的方向了。其实我们在这个 ESG 这方面，其实有一直不断的做努力啦。我们也吸引到很多有关于这样的一个客户，包含一些欧美大厂啊。This time we we'll take advantage of Empower Online, expand the exposure of Taiwan quality to the whole world. Its website design is also very flexible. In addition, we can fully understand the situation in the scene. Now we want to join the virtual conference. It's a good chance for us to look for new suppliers. There's a lot of interesting possibilities to follow up. It's a good marketplace to work for. Empa 展在商用的这个契机上，又得到了很多的机会，差不多增加了三倍的营业额。每年来参加都有一定的成果，可以在短短的四天之内接触到非常非常多国的不同的客人。我相信全世界就看到台湾的优良产品。Empa is one of the biggest exhibition for auto parts in the world. If you get a chance to come to Taiwan, you got to visit Empa. 我觉得其实看展最有温度就是来到现场，你也可以知道整个产业的节奏。Electronics and the LT Taiwan 2022 will be exhibiting at the Nangang Exhibition Center Ho Wan from October 26 to 28, and be held virtually until November 8. These two shows will also be held concurrently with TPCA Show Taipei and Up to Taiwan. Good morning, Coco. Welcome to Syscom. I see that you are with NetMaker. Please follow me. Our senior director, Max, is waiting for you. Welcome, Welcome to Taiwanics and ALT Taiwan 2022 show. Please visit us at AO509A. Hi, everyone. My name is Libby, business development manager of Panasonic Taiwan. You can experience Panasonic's mixed reality system, AMR robotics, solutions and the AI technology at our booth. Can't wait to see you in AIoT Taiwan. This year, for Titronix, we have provided solutions for these three areas. The first one, new energy. We have provided solar power testing solution. And for the second one, automotive electronic, we have provided ISO 16750-2, let's blow. And the last one, battery management system, we have provided charging and discharging for batteries. In addition, there will be many events during the shows this year, such as the IoT Education Forum and Procurement Meetings. Please register now and see you at the show ground.
ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We would like to welcome you to the 2022 Smart E-Mobility Forum. This morning's program will begin momentarily, so please be seated. This morning's program will begin in three minutes. Please mute your mobile phone before the program begins. And please keep your mask on at all times. We thank you for your cooperation.
morning, ladies and gentlemen, and online viewers from around the world. Welcome to the 2022 Smart E Mobility Forum. With the rise of electric vehicles and autonomous driving technology, the future of smart mobility will involve more diverse applications, such as Internet of Things, cloud computing, and semiconductor design. With the coming of the era of software designed and defined cars, e-mobility represents the next blue sea market for the Taiwanese industries. We would like to, first of all, introduce the VIPs who are in attendance today. Distinguished guests, please stand up, wave at the camera, and say hello to the online audience. Now, with a warm round of applause, please help me welcome today's guest of honor. First, Deputy Director General Guan Zhili, Bureau of Foreign Trade, Ministry of Economic Affairs. Next, we would like to welcome the co-organizer of the forum, Ms. Alina Li, Executive Vice President, Taitra. Next, we would like to welcome today's speakers, Mr. Yao Ting Wang, President, Taiwan Power Company. Next, we would like to welcome Erdo Elver, President and CEO, Siemens Taiwan. We would also like to welcome Shaina Kao, President of Yes Charging Service Co. Limited. Please also help us welcome Zhong Jie Chang, CEO, Gus Technology Co. Limited. We also would like to welcome Jay Sheng, Managing Director, Automotive OEM, Garmin Asia. We would like to thank you for gracing us with your presence today. First, please help me welcome Elena Lee, Executive Vice President of Titra, as she delivers her welcoming remarks. General Lee, Bureau of Foreign Trade, and all the speakers today, including President Wang from the Thai Power Company, and Mr. Erdel Elver, President and CEO of Siemens Taiwan, and Zhong Jie Chang, CEO of Gus Technology, China Kao, President of ES Charging Service. We would also like to thank Ray, also from Siemens, for joining us today. I would also like to welcome all the speakers in attendance today. Good morning. Dear friends and colleagues, joining us in person and online, on behalf of TITRA, I would like to welcome you to the 2022 e-mobility forum. As the global awareness of energy conservation and environmental protection continues to rise, countries are offering subsidies and announcing timetables to phase out the sale of new petrol and diesel vehicles, which has accelerated the research and development of vehicle, of electric vehicles. And this has also accelerated the development of the entire supply chain, thereby creating many business opportunities. According to IHS market survey, the global electric vehicle market is expected to grow to 20.9 million units by 2022 and reach 51 million units by 2027. And now we know that by which time electric vehicle sales will officially overtake traditional fossil fuel vehicles and become the mainstream. 
This also means that by 2027, electric vehicles can be seen around the world and will become the main stream and the main driving force for the automotive industry. We could also see that the number of electric vehicles sold in Taiwan is 6,360 in 2020. And last year, the number was 7,276. You might have noticed that uh, a joint venture has been announced between Honghai and Yulong. The launch of the LuxGen Model N7 which is uh, produced here in Taiwan and sold uh, at the price under 1 million NT. And the sales number has exceeded 15,000 15, units within two days of its launch, surpassing the total number of electric vehicles sold in Taiwan in the past two years. And we know that uh, on the industrial side, uh, the output value of domestic automotive and electronics reached 295.8 billion, almost 300 billion NT dollars last year. And thanks to rapid automobile electrification and continuous promotion of the government, it is estimated that the output value will double, reaching 600 billion NT dollars in 2025. It will become a new driving force for the growth of the automotive industry in order to help Taiwanese companies capitalize on this growth momentum and expand to overseas market. Titra, with the support of the Bureau of Foreign Trade, and I would like to uh, particularly give thanks to uh, Chairman Huang of Taitra has continued to research and develop various overseas automobile and uh, automotive electronics markets. And we have gone to Detroit for an expo. And in uh, March next year, we'll be leading groups to uh, Europe, United States, and as well as uh, southbound policy countries, including India, to tap into overseas markets. And Titra also facilitates business matching, market development, and overseas exhibitions and other sales expansion activities. We have signed MOU with overseas associations and automobile industry groups to assist Taiwanese companies to partner with overseas market players. Within Taiwan, the Bureau of Foreign Trade also organizes various expos for the electric vehicle industry every year, including the Taipei Empa exhibitions and the 2035 e-mobility Taiwan exhibition, in addition to innovation competitions, forums, and digital marketing activities. The forum today features a stellar lineup of speakers who are the movers and shakers of the automotive industry. The MC has already introduced a number of speakers who will be sharing their insights with us this morning. In addition to those speakers who have already been introduced, in the afternoon we will also have speakers from Mosaic Venture Lab, an accelerator for the automobile industry supply chain, Texas Instruments, a leading analog IC and automotive chip company, Garmin, a major international navigation company, and Chonghua Telecom. These companies will also be joining us today to discuss four topics, new energy saving opportunities, new materials, new technology, and new services. They will explore energy deployment, power grids, and supply charging and battery technology innovation, as well as consumer experiences. With its complete vehicle supply chain and flexible production advantages, Taiwan is expected to play a key role in the era of electric and intelligent vehicles. Thanks to Taiwan's strength and experience in the development of its ICT industry,
So once again, we invite all of you to make more use of our information platforms and services to keep abreast of market trends and grasp business opportunities. Lastly, I hope you have a fruitful participation in this year's exhibition, and I wish you good health and prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Executive Vice President, for your wonderful remarks and your encourage to explore more business opportunities in Europe and also in the U.S. as well as in the Southeast Asian market. Also, we would like to welcome all of us to join the overseas opportunities for further exploration. And now we are going to invite Deputy Director General Li. Li Guanzhi of the Bureau of Foreign Trade of the Ministry of Economic Affairs to give us his remarks. Please. Dear participants on site, online, business leaders, good morning. So please forgive me for not addressing each and every one of you. As mentioned by Titra's Executive Vice President, she already explained the development of the e-mobility industry as well as the agenda today. So on behalf of the organizer, Bureau of Foreign Trade of the MOEA, once again, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of the speakers from home and abroad this morning and this afternoon. Also, I would like to thank all of the vendors for being with us here today. So in terms of our pursuit for national development and the evolution of energy policies, we see that when it comes to e-mobility, definitely it's related to the energy infrastructure. So against this backdrop, our government and Thai power company have established a nationwide efficient smart grid for Taiwan. So the smart grid will become the foundation for e-mobility and the development of the EV industry. I'm confident that with the joint efforts of the government, academia, industry, and research institute, whether in the area of materials, technology, and even in the areas of services, we can create a platform for sharing and also in terms of the elevation of our competitiveness. Definitely, we will be able to push our development to new heights. And through the establishment of our industry, definitely, Taiwan's economic development will achieve new levels. Over the past three years, although we are under the impact of the pandemic, we also see the changes in the supply chain. But in terms of Taiwan's overall economic development and our exports, we do see stellar performance. As of this September, we do have positive growth, but we also see greater uncertainties in the areas of inflation, rising interest rates, and also the change in supply chain and the rapid changes in the global demands. Taiwan and other countries are also presenting different ideas about our future prospects, but we are confident that in terms of our international competitiveness, it is definitely be built upon our advanced technologies and wonderful method that is to see our customers and the market as priorities. We would like to take advantage of our innovation and capacity so that our industry will have a better prospect. In the EV and smart mobility area, now many Companies in Taiwan have made outstanding results in the car electronics and car body manufacturing. Now we are among the one of the players in the international supply chain, especially in terms of the ICT and AI, 5G, and advanced uh, chips for the car. Taiwan secures its place in a global supply chain. So in the future, the MOEA will continue to work with TITRA and also work with our Bureau of Foreign Trade. We will continue to maintain close cooperation with the multinationals and foreign markets, continue to boost our efforts so that our good solutions will be integrated in the overseas market, as well as the major uh, 
planning for smart cities around the world so that we can achieve better business opportunities. Once again, thank you very much for attending today's forum. I'm confident that through today's fruitful discussion in April of next year, you're also cordially welcome to join our 2035 e-mobility exhibition. It will take place in April of next year. So I look forward to your continuous support. Thank you very much. Please remain on the stage. And now, please move to the center of the stage. And now it's time for a photo call. Thank you once again to Deputy Director General Lee. So now we would like to welcome back to the stage Executive Vice President of TITRA, Ms. Alina Lee. Next, we would like to invite our speakers to come up to the stage. Please welcome Mr. Yao Ting Wang, President of Taiwan Power Company. Also, we would like to welcome Ms. Sheena Gao, President of Yes Charging Service. Also, we would like to welcome Ertel Elper, President and CEO of Siemens of Taiwan. Please come to the stage. Also, CEO of Gus Technology, Zhang Zhongjie. Also, Managing Director of Automotive OEM Garment Asia, Mr. Jay Shen. Please remove your face mask. So please give us your big smile. Please look at a camera. Three, two, one. And for the second photo call, please give us your thumbs up. For the brighter future of the e-mobility and the EV industry in Taiwan. Once again, a round of applause to all of the distinguished guests. Thank you. Please return to your seat. Thank you to all of the speakers. Thank you. As mentioned by our two previous speakers, we know that smart mobility and EV industries are booming in Taiwan and the world. So the automotive industries and other high-tech industries in Taiwan have tried to have crossover cooperation through the R&D and design to manufacturing. We can have a complete supply chain here in Taiwan. So we do see a lot of promises in the EV industry in Taiwan. So that we can build a more comprehensive industrial chain. And of course, we are quite hopeful, but we understand there are challenges along the way. So in today, we have four topics for further discussion. So we would like to know more about the latest trend. So, first of all, we're going to focus on new energy saving. We know that infrastructure or the smart grid and also stable power supply and high efficiency power supply are the critical issue for our future development. So our first two speakers will talk about new energy saving. So how can we use the energy in a smarter and more efficient way? So first of all, we would like to welcome President of Taiwan Power Company, Yao Ting Wang, to talk about smart grid evolution in Taiwan. Please welcome our first speaker, President Wang of TPC. Deputy Director General Lee, Executive Vice President Lee, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I have attended a lot of forums recently, but I think today's forum is my favorite topic. Why? This is because 
this opportunity will bring tremendous impact on Taiwan's economy. So when it comes to electric vehicles, EVs, I think we have already started the deployment for TPC. In the past, EVs and also the cells were expensive, but we know that the price of cells will drop but its efficiency will fulfill the market's demand. And once we know when the time comes, definitely we will see great success. Again, this backdrop, how can TPC respond to the trend? How should we prepare ourselves? I have asked my colleagues to be fully prepared over the past few years, and we have done a lot of studies. And over this course of time, we saw that two years ago, I told them time is up. The time has come. It's about time that we started to make promotion and reach out to the public and the industries, telling the world that TBC is ready for the new era to come. So this is uh, what I would like to uh, share with you in the beginning. So this is my outline for today. So as you can see, to respond to the coming of the new era, We believe that we are expecting the rise of the electric vehicles and also Taiwan's green energy portfolio by 2050. So in terms of Taiwan's energy portfolio, we are already making changes. This diagram shows you a few important numbers. You see that the green portion represents the renewable energy. It has been increasing, and then we believe that it will be maximized over time. This is a world trend because we have a goal of 2015 zero, net zero, uh, which is to tackle the challenges posed by uh, the exacerbating uh, climate change. And this is a global goal that we have to really look up to. So the pink portion is the gas-fired uh, a generation which will also increase and of course gas-fired electricity has exceeded coal-fired electricity this is because gas-fired um, 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 produces about um, 0 0.4 kilos of uh, carbon per a kilowatt of electricity produced. However, the coal burning produces 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 kilograms of carbon per uh, kilowatt of uh, energy generated. Uh, not only that, uh, coal firing also produces more air pollution. And a nuclear power generation has uh, the potential problem of uh, the waste uh, storage. So that is not an option that is viable for Taiwan. And another uh, area which is the which, which is represented by the yellow portion, which is the solar energy. And the green portion is represented by uh, wind energy. It's been growing fairly slowly yet steadily. However, the infrastructure of the, uh, the over of the offshore windmill will be completed at the end of the, this year, and 200 different uh, windmills, uh, wind turbines will be added to this portfolio. We also have the uh, thermal energy, geothermal energy. We face more challenges in this area because you need to dig down into um, the surface for over um, a thousand meters. Uh, Taiwan is located on the seismic belt, so we will need to explore these wells and uh, make them deeper in order to find the sources of the heat. So this is one area we are also exploring, but it is uh, taking uh, small steps. So for the renewable energy, the largest contributor is not just the Thai power, because that Thai power is not able to uh, do it by itself, whether it's by uh, whether it's in terms of solar energy or wind. Uh, energy. So we will need to combine our efforts with uh, private enterprises. We have signed contracts uh, with local enterprises uh, to create uh, rates for feeding tariffs. And we are providing these uh, the electricities to medium to small size companies as well as large tech companies. We have been able to overcome many bottlenecks over the years so that the people who generate power could transmit power to our power grid and then which 
we can then resell to those who need green power. And I believe that this is the future of renewable energy for Taiwan. Thai Power's purchase of renewable energy also skyrocketed in recent years, as can be shown in this diagram. We need to create smart and friendly uh, power grids, and this is a very strong focus of our efforts in recent years. So the local uh, uh, companies have been working very closely with us. Let me give you an example. Uh, the electricity trading mechanism is changing all the time. Between the dynamic between the sellers and the buyers uh, is bound by a contract. There has to be very transparent information, real-time information. So we play a very important role uh, because this is a pain point that has been communicated to us by the industry. For individuals and small and medium-sized companies, they could also make use of such a mechanism to obtain the power, the renewable power that they need. So here is our zero emission goal roadmap. Uh, so we are looking at the supply and the demand sides of the dynamic. So this diagram sums up our roadmap. Uh, it is a very simplified diagram. However, it should give you a rough idea of where we're headed. From the supply side, we really need to look at the zero emission goal. In order to reduce carbon emission, we can do it uh, uh, by adopting the following methods. Number one, for the gas firing plants, we will we could actually think about hydrogen co-firing, LNG plus hydrogen. We are increasing the percentage of hydrogen in our gas firing plant. It has been increased to 5%. And then we hopefully, it will, it will be increased to 10% and, and 20%. And in the end, it will be purely natural gas firing in power generation. So this is our roadmap, as you can see on the slide. So we are working with uh, private enterprises to make it happen. We have uh, signed a MOU with Siemens. This, in fact, took place in April this year. We are working on a project at the Shinda uh, generation plant to upgrade the generating units. So we will be opening up public tenders very soon. And then the upgrading program will begin momentarily. And in 2025, the hydrogen co-firing will be implemented. And it will start with 5%, and that it will then be increased to perhaps 10% by 2030. And ammonia co-firing is another example. Um, this is used in co-firing plants. When burning coal, we add ammonia to the mixture to increase the energy generation efficiency. In fact, we have been working with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries at our Linko plant. Uh, in fact, we will be signing a memorandum of understanding at the end of this year year, and hopefully we'll reach the goal of ammonia co-firing 5% by 2030, and then this number will be raised again uh, by 2040. Is that enough? You might be asking. The reason why we're not able to switch to renewable energy entirely, we still need this traditional way of power generation. This is really because we need a more balanced energy portfolio. Whether in power generation or usage, the two sides need to be balanced. Every year, every single moment, uh, the electricity consumption is fluctuating. Whenever someone flips a switch, the electricity is used and vice versa. Versa. Therefore, we will need a more multifaceted and a flexible mechanism. We will not be able to keep up. For example, from the supply side, a unit breaks down and uh, our supply goes down and the, our frequency goes down. When that happens, the entire system experiences extreme instability. It could blackout. It could cause blackout and nobody would get electricity uh, there could be uh, power outages across the entire island. That is something that we're trying very hard to prevent. Therefore, we are, on, we are looking at uh, options that are not made available by renewable energies or solar energies. So we do this by using hydrogen and ammonia coal firing. 
So the and of course we would need to capture the carbon dioxide that is emitted in the process. So this is called CCS, which is uh, the carbon capture and sequestration. Many people ask. What is the risk in between? Is it going to explode? When we, uh, through carbon sequestration, the carbon dioxide is turned into liquid that is stored underground or uh, in the seabed. There's also the biofuel that we're looking into. The generating units and dashing power plant have been upgraded to use biofuel. So we will be using, for example, wooden pellets uh, for this purpose. Uh, this is a eco-friendly as well as a net zero energy source. Like we said, we'll be experimenting with that at, uh, at the Shinda power plant. We also need to be aware of the rising energy demand in Taiwan. Let me give you an example. I think this is in July 2022, Hualien registered the highest temperature on Taiwan's record, 41.2 degrees Celsius. Taiwan's power consumption has continued to break records and reaching f reaching uh, 40,748 megawatt in July 2022. So you can see uh, the records. Uh, have continued to be broken. And this is due to people's need to use ACs and electronic appliances. And another very important point that we need to consider is that as people switch to uh, electric cars and vehicles, uh, people will have more and higher demand for electricity. So what are our strategies to tackle the rising demand of uh, electricity? We will need to look at the need to reduce carbon emission while uh, meeting the needs for uh, charging the electric vehicles. So we are expecting a huge paradigm shift because the government is providing incentives for people to switch to electric cars. So with that happening uh, and the rising demand for electricity on the horizon, what are our strategies? But before I answer that question, let me show you how governments around the world have announced timelines for adopting electric vehicles and phasing out the sales of um, fossil fuel cars. If you look at the newly launched model, at European car shows, you will see that the, those new models are all electric vehicles. And we believe that by 2030, electric vehicles will consume 2,390 gigawatts of electricity annually. And uh, it will also increase uh, to 20,530 gigawatts annually with the rise of electric vehicles. The charging of electric cars is quite different from charging, say, a regular appliances. When charging an electric vehicle, we need to, once we connect uh, the car to the charging pile, we could decide whether the car is actually going to be charged at the specific moment. In the house, when you switch on the light, you're using electricity. However, sometimes when you drive your car and you arrive at your workplace, you don't need to charge immediately. You can choose to charge immediately or charge later. You can leave your car, and the system could decide. The AI at the that's connected or that's controlling the charging point could decide when to charge the car. So this is better for the environment, and this is good news for people's wallet because you could choose to charge it when the electricity prices are relatively lower. So Thai Power on the demand on the supply side could uh, coordinate and control the charging mechanism and time in order to achieve greater charging efficiency, especially now when we seek to develop and make use of renewable energy. What this means is is that during the day, particularly at noon, we have a lot of energy. However, at night, people are using energy and it drops down again. When solar energy kicks in, for example, in the middle of the day, for our grid, we need to uh, lessen our load because we need to save that space for renewable energy. When at night, there's no solar energy, 
and our baseline will have to be raised in order to supply the increasing needs for electricity when people have gone home. Therefore, the wire grid in the future will have to be smart and flexible and highly adaptive. We will need to look at the energy storage system combined with the grid. We hope that in the foreseeable future, maybe three to five years down the road, the electric vehicles could actually send power back to the grid. It could be used as a storage device. Of course, we have to do this in compliance with uh, existing regulations. So when necessary, our grid system would be sending signals so people could sell the energy back to Thai Power, sending it back onto the grid. Uh, sharing the energy and selling the energy that has been stored in their electric cars. We have been talking with electric car companies uh, to explore opportunities in this regard. So at night, when people are using most electricity, we don't need to charge our cars at this time. So people drive their cars and park it at home, and they connect it to the charging pile. However, uh, once you connect it to the charging point, it starts charging. But you do not necessarily have to charge at that point. And you could delay it by five to six hours, and you can start charging your car at 11 o'clock uh, in the late at night uh, to enjoy a lower uh, tax tariff. So this is uh, better for the environment and also uh, more economical for people who need to charge their cars at home. Now let's look at the transmission of power. In the past, the power transmission is based on radio distribution. It was unidirectional and conventional. It is like transmitting water from the reservoir to every household to the low from uh, low voltage to high voltage you see a lot of um, power towers across taiwan the greater the heavier the current and we also use copper wires for power transmission. So when the heavy current is being transmitted, there is energy loss. So with lower current, we could try to lower the energy loss during the transmission process. So what we could do is that uh, what we do is we transmit uh, um, all the power to different uh, transmission stations at lower currents to minimize energy loss and then it's uh, dispatched to different households. However, in the future, uh, renewable energy is being generated at different locations throughout the city. The power grids are becoming more networked by lateral or even multilateral and smarter. They're smaller and more decentralized grids. So electricity flows multi-directionally. Those who use electricity can also generate electricity. So we need to invest in the uh, power generation and sharing grid infrastructure. Uh, Thai Power has been investing very heavily in various projects to enable this vision to happen. Let me give you an example. A lot of the uh, wind power is being generated in offshore wind farms. How about solar energy? It's usually generated uh, at uh, a solar energy farm south of Changhua. This is because land is more available uh, when you're away from big cities and there's more direct sunlight between Changhua and Pindong County, which is located in the southernmost tip of Taiwan. In the past, the power transmission uh, cable uh, doesn't really go far down to the southern uh, part of Taiwan or to uh, these remote areas uh, because usually in the remote areas there are just simply some farms. However, we see that we have created uh, nine more substations and added ten major power transmission lines because we have renewable energy generation uh, spots scattered throughout Taiwan, particularly uh, in southern Taiwan. So our plan, uh, our plan was to 
what could date back to 2016 when we decided that they will focus on renewable energy, so we upgraded the infrastructure to enable these more decentralized grids to send power back to the grid. So this is a, a, a diagram that shows you the structural change on the supply side. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, the trend, so I will skip the slide. This slide shows you smart grid evolution blue map of Thai power. You can see that we started in back in 2011 and 2013 uh, was the year when we really took off. And in 2016, we introduced uh, the 61850 standard for substations. There was mass deployment of smart meters. Uh, we also installed power trading platforms, set up offshore wind farm mills, and expand fiber optic networks. This is very important because we need to balance the supply and the demand side. We also need to uh, create balance between different regions across Taiwan. So in case of emergency, we can be more flexible. To achieve regional balance, we need ICT being added and embedded in our power grid. So for Thai power, this this is a very important goal. We have been working on achieving this goal for the past decade. And this diagram shows you the smart grid deployment strategic roadmap of Thai power. The key to moving forward to a net zero electricity portfolio is to create a smart power grid that makes good use of green energy. In the past, embedding ICT elements in a smart grid was very, very pricey, and the price was um, literally prohibitive. However, in recent years, we're able to do that because it has become more affordable uh, and achievable. So we've been doing that so that the, the power-related information can be transmitted and and even in remote areas, in remote farms or in the remote mountainous areas, we could be collecting real-time information easily. And Thai Power has been doing this for over a decade. The ultimate goal is that we want to be more decentralized and uh, to be able to dispatch and coordinate power supply across different districts uh, across Taiwan. We all remember that uh, in, on March 3rd this year, we had a major power outage. And uh, we uh, conducted, therefore, a thorough internal review to identify major areas for improvement. We have been rolling out the resilient smart power grid project to enhance the stability of power supply. We enhance the resilience of the grid um, to promote the effective use of green energy and achieve net zero by decentralization and uh, strengthening and defensive upgrades. And uh, the, we have uh, allocated about 500 billion uh, NT dollars. Long-term plan will cost $300 billion. Near-term plan will be costing um, $87 billion. Mid-term plan will be costing us $170 billion. I will be... Uh, Talking. This slide shows you that we have been enhancing our power distribution networks to reduce the number and duration of power outages. Now, I want to talk about the management of the demand side. I think this has a lot to do with the development of the power generation and management industry. So I would like to spend a, a little bit more time to talk about the demand or consumption side management. So this is a master chart, if you will, to show you that the users, the and all the different uh, private corporations that are generating renewable energies and how they interact with one another. This is a very uh, complicated diagram. However, in the large green triangle, we have the light green on the far left side to dark green on the right hand side. So you see a decrease in the response time. It goes from annual planning to monthly planning to the day before to the day F. For example, now I want 50 megawatt. Would you be able to supply that in the shortest amount of time? Not within one second, maybe within a millisecond. So 
or would it take you a few minutes or a few hours? The more you are toward the left hand side, the longer it takes you to respond. Sometimes you respond by receiving the notice the day before, or are you able to respond on the day off? Now, it's important to manage charging for electric vehicles. This is really because each electric vehicle、uh, could have different wattage. The car and the power station could negotiate. It could be determined ahead of time to determine the wattage transmitted when there are fewer cars. Each car could. Receive more electricity. Now, when there are many cars that are being charged at the same time, the user may not get to decide whether the car will be fully charged.、Um, the, each car may get a lower voltage. So sometimes, when you get home at 6 p.m., let's say maybe 8 p.m., our manage our power management system, which would then have to be、uh, developed, will then control the charging points. Um, so this power management system EMS, which is decentralized, it will regulate charging power while monitoring the charging conditions. So this would exist in different charging spots to determine when's the best time and to charge each electric vehicle to what extent. So this is we will need to standardize、uh, the the user surface interface、uh, the. Charging piles and the EMS would then have to communicate with high power and with the cars, with the vehicles themselves. So, from the high power's perspective, our job is is to dispatch and coordinate. Let me give you an example. So, we have a time horizon. Which is shown in the diagram at the bottom. This is a electric scooter charging、uh, stations packed with Thai Power、um, between Thai Power and Gogoro. So to the left, we have the noon time and sometime in the morning. And as you can see, that it's all these charging stations of Gogoro is charging、uh, around noon time. However, in the evening, it's discharging, and then. Uh, then it charges again, and then between six and eight p.m., these charging stations are discharging again. So this is the agreement with Thai Power、um, at the battery exchange stations of Gogoro. So we have here we on the left hand side we have the energy storage and and HEMS and the electric vehicles. This represents our future vision for decentralized energy aggregation. For example, ACs are now manageable and becoming smarter. This would also be applied to, for example, water heater, washing machine, dryer, and refrigerators. They will be charged at the appropriate time, not at any given time. If we're able to design a system and a mechanism that would enable all these household appliances to be charged at non-peak hours,、uh, it would be more eco-friendly, and the consumers would be able to save on utility bills. In fact, we. Have developed、uh, this diagram, which shows you the different、uh, time horizons when a car may be charged. When you leave the house, your car is charged. You go to the workplace, it is charged a little bit, and then in the commercial space or in the shopping mall, it could be charged furthermore, and it could also be charged at service areas. At the、um, along the highway, then you go home. You do sm uh, uh, slow charging. Slow charging is less damaging to the battery. So sometimes you have fast charging, and at certain spots we have slow charging. So here we have a chart that shows you home charging, commercial space charging, and public space charging. At home charging, it's slow charging. At、uh, commercial spaces, we have primarily slow charging and supplemented with fast charging. In public spaces, it's primarily slow charging, and sometimes it could be fast charging at this service area. This also shows you、uh, car's journey and when it could be charged, and how EV spec 
specific meters can be used at different charging spots. We actually have set up an EV smart charging demonstration site at Taipei City to simulate charging facilities in public parking lots, commercial buildings, and residential complexes. The charging facilities are equipped with special meters, and the power supply and power lines are planned in an integrated manner to showcase different charging scenarios, as I had already mentioned. We need to create this market and um, be more uh, diversified in meeting everyone's charging needs. EV fast charging stations can be set up in different service areas along major highways. Take the Qingshui service area as an example. Each time, we, we might have over a hundred spots, and then each spot may require 300 kilowatts. Well, I would need to set up a, an electricity substation to supply that electricity demand, and that could take 10 years of long-term planning. We know that 10 years down the road, we know that uh, at these uh, service stations, there will be more and more uh, electric cars that will have to be charged at the same time. So we need to plan ahead of time to complete the construction of EV fast charging stations in each area along the highway by the end of 2025. In response to the rising demand for electricity in service areas, we have developed short, mid, and long-term power supply plans. I know I'm running out of time, so this is the uh, rates for EV charging. The the idea is really simple. Uh, so what we have here is that if you want to charge at peak hours, you're paying 8 NT per kilowatt. However, if you charge at noontime or in the middle of the day, you can save 80% of a price. So EV plus HEMS uh, could be an emergency power supply system. By combining the two, the, the electric vehicle can be turned into a mobile energy storage device to provide the power needed by the family during, non, during peak hours or emergency uh, situations. In the face of climate change, carbon reduction is the key to a sustainable life. The region and we will need to achieve all these goals by working together. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful sharing. And it seems like if you want to better manage the grid and also power, it takes new technologies and Siemens that solution is definitely one of the areas for consumers to pursue. And we can make the energy system a much smarter and more flexible one in the future. So we're going to invite our speakers to give you more details. So please welcome our next speaker, Mr. Erdal Elver, President and CEO of Siemens Taiwan. I could continue in Chinese. I'm sorry you have to switch in your brain into English. <laughs> so, the gentleman has briefly introduced what I intend to talk about. In fact, we are going through different transformations. The major transformation is, in fact, driven by the digitalization. We also talk about digital transformation. It changes nearly everything, how we manufacture, how we communicate, but also it changes our mobility systems. And it also changes, in fact, uh, the, the infrastructure related to the, well, transportation respective of what we call mobility systems. So I will talk a bit about this, what we also call grid edge and also share with you some examples what we did in different places in this world. Of course, you see in the title, we are talking about, well, creating a sustainable future. Sustainability is nothing new, but it's becoming more and more relevant. And sustainability has different dimensions, as you might know. We also talk about the ESG, environment, social and governance aspects. Especially if we look into the environmental aspects, we really need to 
really change and, and transform things. And in fact, the biggest challenge is, is nowadays coming from climate change. There's still a lot of other challenges going on, be it the recession, inflation, and even the war. This all will probably be over one day. But climate change might keep us busy for a long time. Therefore, we have to really also change things and change, uh, well, um, uh, in many areas, what we do, especially we have to reduce the CO2 emissions. And you see in this picture, we have to really reduce the CO2 emissions by 50% in order to reach our goals, net zero to become 2050. You might know Taiwan set the target to become carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, this takes, well, still a lot of efforts to, to reach this goal. My own company, Siemens, has set the target to become carbon neutral by 2030, nearly 20 years before. And we have, we have done a lot. And I also will share with you what we are doing to support our customers on this way. And to do so, also, we need to increase the portion of the renewables. Taiwan is good on track. If I see all the projects going on in the, in the offshore area, but also with the solar PVs, it is good. We are good on track, but we have to probably speed up the things and, 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 and uh, get them faster into, into, into operations. Um, well, as I said, the, the, we are talking about transformations. Also, the mobility systems are transforming, changing into, into electric cars, which is good, which is good. And hopefully, we will also charge them with the renewable uh, energy or the energy generated from renewables and with this we will be able to contribute again to the CO2 uh, reductions and you see also some some numbers that that we might you know uh, the growth use of EV passengers vehicle by around 25 percent per year until 2030. Um, last but not least, we have to also find ways, technologies and, and, and reduce the, the CO2 emissions, not only reduce but also apply, deploy technologies which can help us to capture uh, carbon emissions and, and, and with this also reduce the emissions. And last but not least, find also ways uh, and, and find net zero alternatives to, to carbon. And there are a lot of ways, especially in the area of electrification. So those are things which we need to do in order to, again, cope with the challenge coming through climate change. As said, energy systems changing. And especially this change is happening at the interface uh, from, from, from energy supply side to the energy demand side. And that is uh, what we also call this, the interface grid edge. So a lot of things will happen on this interface in order to manage the, the changes, the transformations which we are talking about in, in our energy systems. If we look a bit deeper into it, and I'd like to share with you in the following slide what I mean with this change. There will be a lot of things which we didn't, didn't well, <laughs> use in the past which are coming. I have just mentioned briefly the integration of the renewables. That is one uh, important aspect which, which needs to be well considered. Integration of renewables and especially, especially the, the, the directions, you know, in the past we get the energy from power plants, transmitted, distributed, consumed, gone. But in the new systems, we are talking also about the, about the producers on the energy demand side, namely buildings or sites will utilize their solar panels and others, generate energy, and want to be able to also feed back into the grid. So that means it will be a multi-dimensional, uh, uh, multi-directional and also multi-dimensional um, uh, flow. And uh, an intelligent energy infrastructure should be and shall be able to manage this multi-directional power flows in a, well, highly volatile power generation. Um, the next one, is well energy storage. This will become more and more relevant topic. Uh, President Wang talked about the hydrogen topics, and also I'm glad that, that, that we are also talking and working together on this topic. The more renewable 
resources we are having, the more we will need the, 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 the energy system or energy storage uh, capabilities. And hydrogen is, of course, one of the ways to store energy. If we generate energy from renewables and not use it at the same time, we can use this energy to generate green hydrogen. So this will be uh, one important element. But also here, in this context at the Guru Dash, we should be able to store the energy what I'm generating in my building in, in, in storage capacities or even load my electric electric vehicle and use it, or if I don't use, or if it is needed in the grid, I should be able to uh, transfer it back into the grid. So that is another important aspect which needs to be managed at the grid edge. The next one will be, well, also related to this topic what I have just mentioned, virtual power plants. Again, sites, buildings will be able to generate their own energy and want to be act as a kind of virtual power plant use their own energy, but also be able to sell it back into the, into the grid. And also here we are talking about blockchain technologies, of course using digital technologies and, and cloud-based applications, uh, to, to be able to trade energy within the communities. So if my neighbor has enough energy because stored his energy in his, in his storage capacities, I should be able to buy the energy from my neighbor using, again, uh, energy trading technologies. And that is something already happening in, in, in some regions in the world. And we have done a project r related to this, by the way, in the US. And if someone is interested, I'm happy also to share more details. Um, the next one is, of course, load uh, balancing and trading. What I have just mentioned needs to be also intelligently managed in the new energy systems. Um, let's move on to, well, buildings. Buildings will become more and more smart. We're also talking about smart buildings, respectively buildings which will be able to generate their own energy through the solar panels, use it respectively, also feed it back into the, into the grid. So that is another aspect. And also buildings will be able to manage their energy consumption and optimize their energy consumption, which also needs to be, again, linked into, into the grid, which also needs to be managed through the uh, software solutions. And uh, the, the term sector coupling is probably not well known in, in Asia yet, but it is something which we're talking a lot in, in Europe, especially in Germany. Sector coupling means coupling for the, the energy sector with other sectors like buildings, transportation. Simple. If I generate uh, hydrogen through renewable energy, I can, be, I can utilize this energy for heating, respectively for cooling or I can utilize this energy for transportation. So that is, that is what we mean with sector coupling behind power to heat, power to transportation. And this is also something which needs to be managed at the grid edge through digital solutions. Um, last but not least, e-mobility. As I have uh, mentioned, and that is in fact my focus in, in this presentation, we will, we will have more and more electric vehicles, and uh, I hope we will have it faster than, 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 than forecasted, because they are in fact the means to optimize and reduce the CO2 emissions in, 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 in mobility systems. And there will be a lot of charging systems which will create a lot of stress to the grids, and which also needs to be managed in, in, in at this grid edge through software solutions. Um, so that are the changes at the interface between, again, energy supply, respectively energy demand. And as I said, it will become uh, multi-directional and, and digital technologies will help us to manage those changes, respectively, create, well, new ways of dealing with the new energy systems uh, in, in different sectors, as I said, in buildings, in building infrastructure, but also in transportation. And I'd like to share with you a bit more about the e-mobility as the grid enabler. And in this context, of course, we have to, again, keep in mind uh, that mobility currently is responsible for around 33% of all energy consumption. So it is, it is nearly one third of energy and also responsible of one fourth of global CO2 emissions. So that means we have to really do something to optimize the energy consumption, but also reduce the CO2 emissions. And uh, just look a bit into the future uh, set. Uh, 
50 uh, percent of new passengers of car sales will be electric by 2040. I'm not sure whether you have listened to the news from, from Europe. Uh, Europe has decided after 2035, uh, uh, how to say it, uh, forbidding the, the sales of, of, uh, of cars with combustion engines. So it means after 2035, all cars must be, shall be electric. So that is the change which is coming, which is good. And, um, and of course, also the goal is reducing the 25% uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in Europe compared to 1990. And we know we are usually following in Asia the, those targets which is set in, in different regions of the world and also wish to see it that we will also follow this here in Taiwan. And uh, well, 80% uh, of world's population will be living in cities by 2050, which will again create additional stress to the transportation systems or to the infrastructure in general, which also needs to be again managed, managed in, a, in a more optimized way again through digital solutions through new ways of managing things and uh, you see some graph related to electric cars uh, development is a forecast uh, you see the, the low case and high case but still there will be a huge growth in the coming years in in, in, in electric vehicles that's the normal let's say uh, electric cars. The same will happen in, in, in conventional or in commercial cars like e-buses, e-trucks and others. And many countries, including Taiwan, by the way, set the target to use uh, e-buses uh, after 2030, if I'm correct. So this is another good way. And also here, such regulations will, have to, will help to drive this, uh, this trend. And uh, you see here again a huge number, around 300% growth of electric vehicles between, uh, between 2021 to 2026. So that is, it is a huge growth. And uh, we as, as Siemens, of course, proud to be part of, of, of this growth and we'll, we'll continue uh, providing our products and solutions to shape this change in the future. And of course, charging solutions will be needed in many areas in city infrastructure. You see a couple of areas. I will later on bring this picture and also give a bit more details. So. Again, in the following, allow me to share with you about what we do to support this, this, this transition in, in, in mobility systems and uh, what are our solutions, what we are providing. Once again, those charging solutions will be everywhere in every form, be it in, in shopping centers, in logistics centers, in parking, in residential areas, and you name it. And that is, that is the feature, what we see. Namely, everywhere where we, are, uh, where we need to move and, and utilize our e-cars, we will be able to provide our charging solutions. In the following, I will go through a bit and share with you what we are doing. This is a bit a bit concept, but I'm, what I'm sharing with you. Of course, as I said, charging infrastructure will be different in, in different areas. We are talking about AC charging, DC charging for, for, for heavy trucks, ship to shore, and also and grid and building connections which I have just shared on the on the grid edge and uh, of course we will pro we are providing connected services uh, remote monitoring is a, is a is a classical example utilizing cloud-based and platform-based solutions and uh, of course we have we are talking about the digital services uh, charging station and depot management also again utilizing the the cloud solutions digital solutions last but not least also managed charging where we are providing consulting and also even financing solutions to those applications and i will later on also share one example what we did in us just to go through uh, the, the portfolio, you see a, a, a beautiful charging uh, system, which is, by the way, available in Taiwan. If you are interested, happy to link you with my colleagues. That's called Versi Charge. We have already deployed and, and selling it in Taiwan to our customers, which is needed for car parks and home installations. Charging time, you see, it might take some hours, depending on the installation. And, and you see also some benefits and highlights. So that is, again, for let's say, normal personal cars. Then we are also providing the, the bigger solution, which is called C-Charge AC2020. And you see the power capacity two times 22 kV. The first one was just up to 22 kV. 
and also you see the, the some some features which we are providing so those are the ac charge but also we have the dc charge which is utilized for well when traveling in town and for short breaks it is, is a powerful charging system uh, within 30 minutes the, the batteries can be charged for example if you have a break and this can be used uh, for for charging uh, uh, cars and then of course uh, another uh, important charging system for for buses and and also for municipal and commercial vehicles which we are providing i will also share with you an example what we did in fact two examples uh, on this what we did and you see also further characteristics the duration of charges respectively the power capacity up to 800 kV um, so those are, in fact, uh, solutions which we are providing to support, again, the e-mobility. E and you see also another picture where we are also supporting depot charging management with our digital solutions. What we did also for some of our uh, city customers in Europe, I will also share with you an example on this. And you see also some advantages of those systems which we are providing. Once again, here those solutions are of course linked with software solutions which help to manage them in a, in a proper way, remote service, remote management solutions, which are of course crucial. In the remaining time, I will share with you some examples of what we did uh, with the nice title saying our portfolio in action. I have also two short clips to also give you a bit of insight. So that is one what my colleagues did in, in London, UK, and you might know London, London is one of the most congested cities in, in Europe. Uh, if you have been there, uh, you might have also experienced. And the goal is to reduce the air pollution in, uh, in London. They have even a system introduced which is called uh, um, uh, congestion charging. In order to avoid congestion, they are charging for different cities. That is an example. Then there are example here, provide e, e charging solutions using the, the, the lamps you see on the picture. And this has been deployed in, in, in London, if I'm correct, around 1,000 charging uh, uh, points in, across Westminster and around 3,000 charges installed across London in different areas. So that's one example. And one of the newest examples where I, I have just mentioned um, uh, charging, uh, wireless charging solutions in the U.S. with the WeTricity is a, is, a, is, a, is a kind of operator offering charging solutions. Even we have invested some money into this company. And uh, it is, in fact, quite innovative charging solutions, wireless charging solutions. You go somewhere, park your car, and, and, and go shopping or whatever meetings. And during that time, your car will be charged automatically. Uh, let me show you a short clip uh, to introduce the system uh, briefly. Need to click one more. Let's hope it works. Yeah, no, that was too much. Go back. You help me, please. This is an ordinary 2018 Tesla Model 3. But you're about to see it do something that is quite extraordinary. Isn't that amazing? Wait, what? You didn't see anything amazing? That is Ytricity's wireless charging solution. So what you're seeing here is this Tesla is charging wirelessly, just as fast as the plug, but with no cords, no cables, no hassle. Extraordinary. All right, so that is uh, the recent example I have just shared with you, our, our uh, work with WeTricity in the US. Another one which we did in Europe provided one of our customers in, in, in Nuremberg, it is a city close to Munich, um, uh, e-bus e charging depot solution where we are also utilizing the renewable energy to charge uh, the buses. Uh, with this, of course, reduce the CO2 emissions. You see around 17 tons less CO2 emissions, but also reducing the, the cost. And, and this is another good example where we are providing our e-bus charging solutions to our customers in Europe. Another one, also in Europe, um, my colleagues have provided a he e-highway dynamic charging for road freight transport. 
also I have a short clip. This is another great example uh, what we can do with, 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 with innovative charging solutions and also with this, again, reducing um, uh, pollutions and optimizing, again, the mobility solutions. Just watch the, the next clip. If I am correct, I need to click one more. As you have seen, high efficient and energy optimized and uh, again, another innovative solution for charging. With this, I have shared with you our portfolio and also shared with you the technologies which we will, which we will be having to manage the changing energy systems, especially at the interface from energy supply to energy demand. And with this, I believe we are empowering all our customers all over the world to manage their transition and also reach their net zero targets by 2050. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President and CEO of Siemens Taiwan. Thank you so much for your sharing for us about this topic. So once again, a round of applause to our speaker. Thank you so much for your sharing. Now we'll move on to the next speaker who will talk about the new materials used in the e-mobility industry. We have already heard two presentations on new energy saving and conservation opportunities. Next, we have Shaina Kao, president of Yes Charging Service Co. Limited. She will talk about the foundation of EV from energy storage to charging solutions. She will explore the status quo of the global electric vehicle industry from the perspective of Taiwan and showcase Taiwan's competitive advantages. Please welcome Ms. Kao. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and online viewers from around the world, good morning. This morning, we have had the honor of attending the presentations by Pipe Tai Power as well as Siemens. We have seen new opportunities in the automobile industry. Please allow me to uh, share my screen and let me first show you these two numbers. 2030, exceeding 30%. The National Development Council has laid out the a carbon zero pathway. This means that 30% of the cars sold in 2030 will be electric cars. And by 2040 in Taiwan, the goal is to reach 100%. That means all the new cars sold in the market will be electric cars. What about the European Union? The European Union is a few steps ahead of Taiwan. Its goal is to make sure that 100% of the new cars sold in the market by 2035 will be electric cars. And the reasons for 
countries around the world to set such goals is because of number one, the rising awareness of、uh, climate change and environmental protection, and number two is the accelerated pace for governments around the world to be more responsive in terms of、uh, setting up new regulations and laws to respond to international climate change goals. Number three is the development and research of new models of electric cars that are being launched by international large car brands. Number four is increasing confidence and interests、uh, in the consumers、uh, when it comes to electric cars. Tesla is a very familiar brand to all of you when it comes to EVs, and this is also a highly respected brand. They've never manufactured cars, but once when they manufactured a car, it became extremely popular because they seized the opportunity of EV. So you can see the price, starting price from 1.7 million to 3.5 million NT dollars. That's the price. As for other manufacturers, have you driven EV? Please raise your hand. More than what I expected. I think more than my previous session. Have you ever ridden on the e motorcycle? So even more people have ridden the e motorcycle. I don't know how you feel when you drive EV. When you hit the brake, you can feel that your back is leaning against the seat. So for the first time, you definitely will feel this way. If you have not tried, don't worry. More and more brands are launching EVs. You can give it a try. The experience is totally different. So traditional car manufacturers emphasize the acceleration from zero to one hundred kilometers per hour, but actually it is quite easy for EVs. Porsche is a very famous brand. It has launched its EV. Now, if you place the order, you will have to wait for one year to receive the car. And also, Mercedes-Benz. Among these car manufacturers, Mercedes-Benz is a very respected brand. It also launched its EQA series, and the price is about 2.18 million NT dollars. So, in mid-June, starting from now, we started to see that it receives orders for EQA, EQB, or EQE. All these are EVs. By 2023, they will have large amounts of delivery. So over here, you can see the dura- endurance. It has reached 496 hours. It only takes 32 minutes of charging to achieve that. Moving on to BMW, the X7. The price is 4.9 million. That's powered by fuel. And for EV, it has the High feature, so the price is 3.3 million for iX series, and the cruising range under the WLTP test specification has reached 425 kilometers. From zero to 100 kilometers, it only takes 6.1 seconds. So, for fuel-powered cars, it's really hard for cars to do that within 10 seconds. But for EVs, actually, five or six seconds, they can move from zero to 100 kilometers, and it only takes Takes ten minutes of charging to achieve that. In addition to these luxury automakers launching EVs, as for the popular brands made for the public, they have also launched EVs. Peugeot in 2023 will launch a series of EVs. So, as we can see from here. From the popular brands to the luxury brands, they have launched EVs one by one. Our executive vice president mentioned that the growth of EVs is extreme, extremely high. From 2018 to August of this year, Tesla actually ranks the highest in the Chinese market, accounting for. 85% of the EV market in Taiwan. As for the rest of the 15%, we can see so many different brands launching their EVs. Porsche ranks number two, only 5.1%. But the problem comes from、uh, supply. So in terms of the curve, because Tesla occupies such a large percentage of the market, when other brands launch their EVs. 
definitely we will see the drop of Tesla's percentage in the overall market. As for the Taiwan EV growth, you can see it's really astonishing. The ICE cars grows by a 4.6%, but for EVs, it grew by 1,063%. Well, in 2021, in Taiwan, in terms of the new EV cars, EV accounts for 2% of the all of the new cars sold in Taiwan. Definitely, we will see faster growth in the future in Taiwan. So if you look at the global EV market, even during the pandemic, we do see 108% of growth in the EV market. And as of now, we have seen 13 million EVs. So I think EV has created a several important records. The first one is we do see three consecutive double-digit growth over the last three years. And the second one, new EVs has accounted for 9% of the new car sales, almost 10% of all of the new car sales. And the third one is that EV accounts for 3% for the world's four-wheel drive. So we understand that in Taiwan, as mentioned by Executive Vice President, Luxogen is a brand in Taiwan. Within two days, their sales reached 15,000 cars. So from the official website, the final sentence is that because we have so many buyers, so this project has ended. So within just two days, they sold 15,000 cars. Why they can reach such astounding result? If you think it's because of the price, raise your hand. Because it's under 1 million NT dollars, an EV manufactured in Taiwan among so many EVs. No EV can be sold under 1 million. The cheapest from abroad will be 1.2 million. So the million dollar threshold is definitely a very important reason. But in addition to the price, if the car is sold under $1 million, then the difference between EV and the uh, fuel-powered cars will be smaller. In addition to the price concern, what are the other concerns for the consumers? First, the market size of EVs is not big enough. People buying EVs will worry about the used car market, whether there is a place for EVs in a second uh, in the used car market. We know that in the first or second year, in a fuel-powered um, car, they do have a market. What about the EVs? Because the EV market is not big enough, so in the used car market, it's not still so popular. Second one, we understand that the charging specifications is not standardized yet. So you may worry that maybe there will not be enough charging sockets for the EVs in the future. And also, President Wang from TPC said that when it comes to charging, it relies on power, electricity. But in Taiwan, we have lots of blackouts. So people may worry that when it comes to charging, there may be a problem. I can charge my car in my home. Can I do it? Will there be a problem? So. The regulations and complementary measures are not comprehensive enough, so the consumers are still worried about the mileage or the range for the EVs because this is such a new business. It is so new that even the Ministry of Economic Affairs does not have clear regulation for EVs. The IDB, Industrial Development Bureau, would like to talk to the car makers and manufacturers but they realized that there is no EV association. After my efforts to communicate with the MOEA, we found that there is no category for the regulation of EVs because this is so new. So no complementary measures are uh, complete. So when the consumers are buying cars, you can see that in cars, 82% of them want to have complete charging facility. And also motorcycles, e-motorcycles, like 82%. So if we go back, we know that this is such a new industry. So what makes the um, charging operator. First, I'd like to talk about the 
suppliers for charging facility like Siemens. It has the DC fast charging and AC slow charging facilities. So. The sellers of the charging piles can be seen as the charging operators, and the red box is the charge point operator, the CPO. So, simply put, they are China Petroleum or Formosa Plastics. They sell oil. So the CPO is that people can find a piece of land. They build the um, charging piles for fast or slow charging. Consumers can go there to charge. So their role is just like CPC. And the third role is MSP, Mobility Service Providers. So MSPs can provide the third-party back-end system services, like also the apps on the front end to the consumers. President Wang of TBC also talked about the energy management system. So that will be under the category of MSP. Some consumers, correction, some operators may become CPOs or MSP. Some may have played two or three roles together. So. Let's take a look at these different roles in a market, and we have different vendors joining this market. So my company, yes, what we do is that we sell charging piles to the construction of charging piles, and also the after-sales market maintenance and the app for charging services to the consumers. We talk about the back-end management. Actually, we provide this kind of services, including the parking lots, as well as the scheduling for the charging piles in the community. Everything is included under our services. When the CPOs and MSP conduct the API, we can also provide customized services. And the most important thing is how we charge. We also have the charging cash flow payment. So we do provide a one-stop service for the charging. So what is the role of the charging operators and how many charging piles are there in Taiwan? Do you think that we do not have not enough um, charging piles? In terms of the DC fast charge, we have 256 stations around Taiwan, 256 around Taiwan. And yes, accounts for 3%. As for AC slow charge, there are totally 1,827 stations. Yes, charging accounts for 13%. As for e-bikes, there are totally 187 stations. and. Yes, accounts for 53%. We have collected data from the market. So this is uh, what we have. So totally, we do have 1,800 stations around Taiwan. We talk about different specs for the charging stations, but in terms of the AC charger, actually it's very clear. Allow me to share with you uh, the different specs through this slide. In terms of the AC slow charger in Taiwan, we have standardized. We use the CNS15511 specification. That is the SAE J1772 spec. So this is the standardized spec in Taiwan. As for China, they use GBT. They have a completely different socket, just like the plug in your home. So we have different sockets for different plugs in your home. And in the U.S., they use type 1. EU, they use type 2. In Japan, they also use their own type 1. It's called job demo. And also, Tesla has its own socket. They use TPC. But starting from Q4 of last year, they go back to type 2. As for AC, well, you can see it's very clear. They have different sockets, different um, specification. Now moving on to DC charger, we have the CCS1 and CCS2. So we call it CCS1 plus N. Uh, similarly, whether it's in EU or US or Japan, they have different specifications. So what about Taiwan? I just want to show you these are the sockets that are adopted in Taiwan. You can see the flags of ROC. So 
the charging. Well, you can see for different cars, there are different areas for you to charge the um, to add the oil. But the oil gun looks the same. But now we have see we only have twenty seven thousand EVs in Taiwan, but there are so many different specifications. So for us as an operator, which one should we choose? For us, that is a very big question for cost. So what kind of cars will use what kind of spec? So allow me to share with you on this slide. Well, in the future, in 2023, there will be different cars and different specifications. But basically, as you can see, Tesla use uh, TBC and CCS2. In Europe, they use J1772. For Japanese cars, they use Jademo. So these are the specs for you to choose from. Definitely, I know people have some concerns when it comes to charging. On the news, maybe you can see um, when it comes to public charging, you may think this may be dangerous. Even when you charge the phone, the phone may explode. What about charging cars? In fact, I think if you're not using the government certified charging piles, it may be dangerous. So on the news, you can see that when people are charging their cars, they may bring the line like from the sixth floor down to um, the ground floor. Uh, they think it's safe, but actually it's dangerous. But actually, you will have to meet the government regulation. If it meets the standards of the government, then definitely we can lower the risk of charging. And also, recently, the government has launched a lot of incentives for the manufacturers. So these policies include, on October 18th, we have the Honhai. They recommend EV products. So for TPC. They also set up a dedicated meter for EVs. So by using dedicated uh, power prices off-peak, they try to solve the problem of power supply. So for operators like us, we try to find our own leverage for Yes Charging and Hua Mao. In uh, Songyan, we have a bus charging area. So. This has also helped us lower the cost. So regarding the peak and off-peak prices, I think that's key because we know that the charging price, the cost is about $580. So definitely we need to think about a dispatch and distribution. But in a community, people still do not know this is very important. We know that in the basement, there will be 10, 20, or 100 parking slots. So if all of the cars are charging at the same time, definitely you need to increase the capacity in your contract. So in this way, we will see that the price of charging will definitely increase. So how can we effectively charge your EV will be the key. So after buying the EV, consumers always think that they will be worried about the range. So fast charging is better than slow charging. Is that so? Is that really the case? Is fast charging better? Mr. Wang just mentioned a very important number. He said like $8. So if you charge outside, the cost of charging will be $8 per hour, so four per kilowatt hour. So for our operator, our cost is 5 NT. You have to think about the cost and also HR and everything. So now for fast charging, for one kilowatt hour, it's about 9 to 12 NT dollars per kilowatt hours. So if the cost outside is 8 NT per kilowatt hours, then if you charge at home, it may be 16 NT dollars per kilowatt hour, so the cost will be extremely high. If you want to lower the cost, if you want to save money, what can you do? So what you should do is that you should charge from home. It should increase to 80% because the power comes from your own um, electricity. So it will be included in the power used from your home. 
so it's a user pay system so at home you can charge for eight full hours but if you charge outside what can you do then you can supplement the electricity outside it should account for only 20 percent so i think this is the most economical formula so by so doing i think it will be best for you to save money and we shouldn't always go for fast charging maybe we can think about that when it comes to yes not all of the areas should have the fast charging piles i think based on the features then people can choose different charging facilities because based on our idea we think that parking means charging when we go to the gas station to get oil within five minutes everything is done so we know that no matter which charging piles provided by the manufacturers even for fast charging you'll have to wait for 10 minutes so 10 minutes of charging what about a car waiting next to you so it will have to wait for 20 minutes the third car it will have to wait for 30 minutes can you wait in a car to wait for 10 20 or 30 minutes waiting for the charge it shouldn't be like this so what we think is that unless in the um, stations along the highway otherwise we don't want the people to wait for so long so when you stop the car then you can charge at the same time so maybe you go to the restroom you get some coffee you get a meal or you go to the movies when you park your car but when you park the car the car is just there and charging at the same time in a parking lot. This is how it should be. If you go to a different hotel, if you stay outside, you have eight hours to charge. Why do you need to charge the uh, car within 30 minutes? So we think that parking means charging. This is the best formula. So now we have different, different areas to use for yes. Whether for fuel, four wheel drive or two wheel drives. What we do is that we provide one-stop services. So wherever you are, we think that we should find the best area for you to char charge. Also, when it comes to fast charging, definitely we want big power companies. Then definitely it will take six minutes, uh, six uh, six months, because TPC will have to build so many charging piles. There are so many engineers; they have to. Uh, verify or to validate I think um, Vice President Wong is just right here I will talk to him later TBC is working extremely hard to build more charging piles but we know that the laws are still lagging behind because this is such a new industry it is so new even the MOEA does not have a category of EV to supervise so we don't know about the complementary measures definitely we know that the companies will move faster than the government because they want to make money so in different places we have installed different charging stations so if you go to the uh, theme park you may stay there for one or two hours so you can leave the ch car to charge there if you go to the golf cart um, range or like if you go to the shopping mall these are the places for you to charge your car so when you buy an EV so you don't need to worry about charging right because when you park your car you can also charge at the same time well of course there is emergency need then you can find the areas for fast charging then you can do it now we have talked about the public use of power now as for the private residential projects when you buy a house you don't need, want to live there just for five or 10 years. When you buy a place, you may live there for 20 or 30 years. So starting from Q4 of last year, the a construction company have seen the opportunity. So they also approached us to talk about cooperation. So I think the charging piles for residents will be even more important because we know the number for public use 
charging piles will be limited. When you finish all of the construction, then it's just like that. There's no more. But what about residents? It's different. When you buy a house, if there is a charging pile in a parking lot, do you think that it adds greater value and it's easier for you to resell your place? Definitely. By 2030, over 30% of the new cars will have to be EVs. So we have a cooperation project with a construction company. So Taoyuan Hualong Bluebird Project, it has a basement of two levels on B1. It has established the slow charging piles. And for B2, there are no charging piles. So when they sell the house, the charging piles price is also added. So parking spaces in B1 will definitely be more expensive than B2, right? So the price of charging piles is added to the housing price. Well, definitely you will have to pay for more than 10 million NT dollars to buy a place. So the parking space will be 1.5 or 1.6 million. Do you think people will feel the price of the charging pile? Not really. So with this design, they actually, the construction company regret it. Why? Because he believed that Actually, they should also establish the uh, charging piles in B2 as well because the parking spaces on B1 are sold better. So if you understand this, if you're having the old uh, residence, what can you do? Definitely you can install the charging piles, but it will be extremely difficult. We have worked with these projects for one year. For one community, if you want to build the charging piles for an existing community, it will take one year to do so. So we need to have site inspection for at least three times. Well, this is really difficult for us to make money. So for those of you who can make money in this industry, I think we are the only um, operator which can make profit. Why are we still doing it? Because this is the trend. Although there are not so many charging piles, it's extremely difficult. We want to secure our place in the market. In the future, when we have reputation, when we have experience, and definitely we can do a better job in the future. We can have more customers. Moving on to the next topic. Oh, I only have one minute left. So now we will move on to energy creation, energy consumption, and energy storage. It seems like a very good model, but in reality, is it? Not really, because the timing is not here yet. Our first two speakers have talked about the solar power generation, which accounts for 70% of Taiwan's generation. Energy storage is a good area. What about energy consumption? Well, the green power can be used, whether in the area of ESG or in charging. I think this is a very good choice, but for now, because the market is not big enough, because the cost for equipment is so high, so if you would like to create a business model, I think this is still very difficult. And if you want about the future, definitely there's a market and definitely this will be the way forward, but we have to wait for the right timing. Now, we are only doing POC. Uh, I need to apologize. I still have half of the topic, half of my presentation. Sorry, I cannot go to the details, but if you would like to know more about this area, we are welcome to contact us. We are yes charging, and we are willing to um, have more communication with you in the future. Thank you very much. We would like to thank Ms. Gao for her excellent presentation. Regrettably, the time is limited. However, we would like to thank her for her most helpful and informative presentation. Next, we would like to invite the last speaker in the morning to speak to us. He is Zhong Jie Chang, CEO of Gus Technology Co. Limited. He will talk about new materials advancing EV battery technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, and online viewers from around the world. 
I am the last speaker this morning. I will talk about lithium batteries and their applications in EVs. And I will also talk about how Gus is advancing battery technologies. I'm not entirely sure about the level of knowledge you have about batteries in general. Lithium battery packaging structure types can be divided into three categories. We have cylindrical cells on the left hand side, the prismatic cells in the middle, and polymer cells or pouch cells on the far right hand side. These are the types of uh, cells that are most commonly seen and available in the market. And in 3C products, polymer cells are often used and it is becoming more and more often in uh, electric cars as well. Tesla cars use the cylindrical cells. As you could see, the 1865 was used in the early stage. It then evolved to 2170 and then to 4680 in the hope to increase the capacity of each cell in order to eventually lower the number of cells used in electric cars. When Tesla was developing cars, uh, Taiwan was not really able to uh, offer uh, pouch cells, so eventually went from Panasonic cylindrical cells. In fact, over 8,600 cells are used in one single car, one single Tesla car. But if you're able to use pouch cells, you can use 300 or even less cells. So from the from the appearance of uh, these lithium ion batteries, they could be divided into these three types. There are also other types, the NCM batteries, as well as the uh, LFP batteries or the LTO or oxides batteries. I will give you a general summary and analysis later. So here we, you could see that we have um, for the cylindrical, we have the cathode and the anodes that are wrapped inside, and then then it's shaped like a, a sandwich. And for the polymer cells, we also have the main brain for separation, aluminum uh, main brain when it's used in electric cars, the pouch cells are considered to be the safest. Why is that? If you Google uh, fire hazards of electric cars or lithium ca um, batteries catching fire on YouTube, you will see a lot of videos. The cylindrical cells has a hard uh, outer shells. However, when it it's involved in an accident, it could explode. However, in the pouch, if you use pouch cells, in the in, in in case of emergency, it would then be expended and then, then the pressure would be released, the smoke would then come out, and it's only when vapor enters the cell that it could catch fire. So this is very, sometimes contrary to what people perceive of, of um, the polymer cells. Now, to determine whether a battery is suitable for usage, we need to look at its high energy density. We need to look whether it has a long life. We also need to look whether look at whether it has a wide working temperature range. It could be fast, it could be charged and discharged fast, and whether it offers excellent safety. And we also want to look at other features. For example, when when it comes to safety, people want it to be ex explosion proof and the materials used must be stable. And we also want to look at uh, lower the possibility of lowering the cost of mass production. Here I'm showing you a range of full electric vehicles and the type of uh, batteries used in these uh, uh, vehicles. Cylindrical 
batteries are used in Tesla. Pouch cells are used in Nissan and most Japanese brands. And as for the Chinese brands, they most often use prismatic cells. I'm which、uh, I'm not listing the Chinese manufacturers here. And the trend is to go bigger in size. So. For the cylindrical, for the model forty six eighty, it is、um, it is、uh, fifteen times the capacity, and for the prismatic pouch, China manufacturers are also in enhancing its、uh, capacity. It actually has four cells in there too. And that it's contained in a in a cell. So you would need、uh, better electrodes in order to enhance the capacitor capacity. So the this comes down to a better design for the electrodes, which should be heavily researched in the lab. Now I would like to show you the different.、Uh, Types used in the major EV models, from including Tesla, Porsche, Audi, and Nissan. Tesla uses cylindrical cells, and its voltage three hundred seventy-five. It uses SIC chips on board. Its、uh, charging performance、uh, is enhanced because it is more advanced in SIC. SIC has enabled it to manage and control, and then the charging process, delivering a better charging performance. However, if traditional car manufacturers get into this market using the same technology,、uh, we might see a different picture here. Porsche already announced that、uh, it will have a fast charge, 800 volt voltage.、Uh, we also see that it's. Uh, high capacity as well, so you would need batteries with good heat radiation characteristics. At this point, cylindrical cells may not be able to have that potential. That's why、uh, Tesla is moving toward sixty of forty six eighty. It is. It is going to. It's going from single tab to no tab. That's why it's stuck in its R and D when coming up with new cylindrical batteries, because the the currents when being charged and discharged,、uh, you would need to find a way for a heat radiation. They need to find a way to. Reduce the inner resistance of cylindrical cells, and this has a major impact on the performance of the cells. So you can see we have the different uh, 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 cell numbers here from Tesla over eight thousand cells to Porsche three thousand three hundred cells, Audi four hundred cells, and Nissan two hundred and eighty eight cells. So we have we see that here. I'm showing you different pictures of the、uh, Nissan. Of the Japanese module and the European module, you have VDA three fifty five, three ninety, and five ninety models. So whether it's in electric buses or in private cars,、uh, this is better for recycling and the entire、uh, product life cycle management. Why is it that electric vehicles? Uh, we'll be moving toward、uh, pouch batteries. Whether it's whether you're looking at the energy density or gravimetric energy density,、uh, pouch cells provide the most benefits. And here I'm showing you the NCM batteries、uh, advantages. If you use pouch batteries, you also have better performances、uh, because it, it's able to be free of the weight of the shell, and also it provides more flexibility in design, better energy density, and lower cell weight. So for the manufacturing. Of lithium batteries, it could be divided into these eight different steps. We have mixing, coating, pressing. Then we have the cutting to reach the density, desired density. Then it's sent into the cutting 
the stacking process, packing, injection, and formation. It could be divided into these eight different steps. So the electrolyte lithium batteries uh, out there are usually uh, manufacturing in this way. However, with solid state ones, you wouldn't need to, you will be able to get rid of the step injection. However, the pressing state would be more complicated. And the stacking state would also be slightly different when it comes to solid state batteries. Uh, here we, we may be able to get rid of the main brain. And, and to replace and get rid of the electrolyte fluid. So that's the difference between liquid and solid state. In terms of the winding and stacking techniques, I have listed their uh, benefits here. These are the two major uh, techniques employed in the industry. How are they different? In the past, 10 to 20 years in China, winding is used because it enables them to uh, speed up the production process. The entry barrier is lower. Uh, however, for stacking, it has lower resistance, longer battery life, because when you have a lower internal resistance, uh, it helps to lengthen battery life because there is less heat being generated when you use the stacking method. So for the next generation of batteries, uh, internal lower internal resistance is of paramount importance because it has a direct influence on battery life. And the internal stress, if you compare the two different methods, um, when you use the winding method, the lithium um, could be stuck in the bending area. However, there is no internal stress if you use the stacking method. In terms of performance, stacking has a higher performance because it allows for heavier electric currents. And safety, of course, stacking is higher, has, offers better uh, safety features. And for the stacking method, the heat is evenly distributed across the cell, thereby providing a higher level of safety. Next, I would like to talk about uh, the battery tabs. Um, when it comes to the uh, soft pouch, usually we see this design, single-sided tabs for pouch cells. And it offers wider surface area, so the heat uh, heating condition is contained, thereby delivering better safety. In the past, it was difficult to make it because the moisture content control was difficult. The material choice was also difficult. And for the electrodes, how do you uh, design the uh, activity of it to optimize its performance? The coating, how thick should it be? How adhesive sh should it be? If we, if we look at NCM battery, on the, the positive side is uh, aluminum and the negative side is copper. Therefore, you need, each company have been, has been focusing on developing a technical know-how to optimize the performance. So for the cell, for the a pouch cell uh, design, like we show here, it's a single cell, offers large capacity, as well as excellent safety. In addition, for gas technology, in terms of uh, in terms of NCM batteries, we could go up to 15C um, or even 20C, a very fast uh, uh, charge and and de and discharge, and then even with LTC batteries that we make, we could have up to 20C, no impact, and we can also go up to five times the uh, charging voltage and the battery still remains to be extremely uh, safe. But in other cylindrical uh, batteries, this could potentially cause explosion and battery fails. Now I would like to show you the technology roadmap of our company. In the Y cell, we have the weight uh, per kilogram. 
and this is our technology roadmap. I think this is uh, very consistent with the international trend. On the top, we have the NCM based. At the bottom, we have LTO based batteries. Um, the density, the energy density, has gone from 70, uh, 70 C, 75. And then we have been working with this Japanese company to increase that number to 130. And the energy density has increased, will be increasing to 150 by 2024. This is uh, mainly attributed to our breakthroughs in material research. We are using different uh, materials to work with LTO. Here we have LNMO with LTO. And the electrolyte in particular, we are using the highly pressurized uh, positive electrode material and non-cobalt battery as well. There's no cobalt at all in the battery in 2023. So next year or the year after ne next year, you will see our newly launched products. We have uh, been working with a Japanese partner to to apply this oxides-based batteries uh, to be used in electric vehicles, electric buses, in low temperature delivery trucks. So uh, at the temperature of minus 60, minus 40 degrees or to up to 60 degrees Celsius, um, its battery life is still very optimal. At, at the, under the condition of uh, 1C, uh, it retains the uh, remaining capacity of 90%. So these are great performance features. And we also see that the um, the end the high nickel ternary cathode uh, material based batteries. So we see this roadmap showing you how it will go from. Now we are at the range of 250 to 280, which is the highest point of an NCM. And people often ask. Is it possible to go beyond 300? It is. I think and then it comes down to the type of material that you use at the negative electrode. So if we are able to use new materials, high nickel ternary cathode. So here we are using graphite. to revolutionize the design. Currently, we have semi-solid state of batteries. Um, a startup in the US, right here, um, up here, the, uh, the energy density is over 400 or even 420. It is a semi-solid state lithium battery that has been uh, developed in the US. The reason why for us to go from liquid to solid state lithium battery is really because the incidents of lithium batteries catching fire have raised concerns around the world. Uh, so uh, solid state batteries are considered an important means of solving this problem. They can withstand high temperatures, meaning heating and puncturing, with no risks of catching fire or causing an explosion. They also offer high energy density. The energy density is increased by using materials with higher capacity density and higher operating voltage, and uh, they are less prone to oxidative decom decomposition after the electrolyte turns into a solid state. Here I'm showing you the next generation of battery in terms of solid state lithium metal. We have here on the right hand side, we have SESAI and the quantum scape. They are, they have also, they are using sulfates uh, to launch new solid state lithium metal batteries. And this is 
And then another company in Taiwan is using solid state oxides uh, to create the same type of batteries. However, this Taiwanese company still has a long way to go. Um, however, these two American companies, batteries can be uh, are readily used, can be readily used. As you can see that they are using a, a, a solid state lithium metal a layer to replace the liquid state ones in the older models. Here I'm showing you a timeline of the development of solid state uh, factory, of solid state batteries. And it was first launched in 1931 and in 2011, Blari launched lithium metal polymer batteries for the automotive sector. However, the batteries will have to be heated up and pressure will have to, uh, have to be applied to the batteries for them to be used. However, in 2011, a Taiwanese company launched the first uh, uh, solid state batteries. It is said that they will be using their semi-solid state batteries in electric cars by 2023. Now, only Chinese companies can claim that they're already using solid state or semi-solid state batteries in electric cars. Many Chinese companies are now saying that they will be uh, like solid state batteries will be uh, used in electric vehicles at the end of this year. We'll see whether they, that vision or that claim will be realized um, in a few months. Now, I would like to show you the three different uh, technical routes for the solid state battery. The first route is technical. The, the route is oxide route. Uh, it is the safest. It has the sandwich kind of structure. The safety is the highest. And the difficulty of research and development is also the highest because ceramic is very brittle. The, the reason why we use sheet-like uh, batteries, it's because we're looking at the next next uh, generation. In the future, there will be no more winding. There will no, no more be coiling. We will be seeing that it's nice and fit and slim. And you use a flex, you use a shapeable uh, exterior to encase the cells. So that's, I believe that's the future. So for the uh, oxides based uh, batteries, uh, they were the they were developed the earliest, but they were, they have been the most difficult to develop. And then we also have the sulfides-based batteries. However, for these batteries, are difficult to produce because sulfides, when in coming in contact with uh, the air, produces uh, toxic gas. Therefore, the material is is great, and the life cycle is also very desirable. But it has technical difficulties when producing it. So during the mass production stage, for example, the Quantascape is one company that's doing that. It's they it's very labor intensive because because it would then it has to be. Uh, separated, the production has to be separated from the uh, atmospheric air. So now, uh, it's I would say it's very hard to mass produce uh, these sulfides-based batteries. Then we also have the last type, which is the polymer-based uh, batteries, polymer and the lithium salt composition. When in a high temperature state, lithium ions move relatively fast, and the formula and temperature can be optimized. So you can obtain high energy density. So it may become the first industrialization of the, of the specific technical direction. So for the time being, when we look at the solid state batteries, they are currently only being used for the charging and the discharging of uh, low currents. They're mostly used uh, in small gadgets and wearables. Um, they have not been applied on the larger scale. I already talked about the solid state batteries based on oxides. Uh, we have the Japanese companies that I've listed here, TDK, FDK, Muraka, 
and uh, Taiyang Yodian, they use LCC, meaning oxide ceramics electrolytes as the main material. Of course, the actual core technology may differ from one company to another, meaning that the cathodes and then anodes materials may be different. For example, you could see that uh, the capacity range varies and compared to the battery cells, we could see a difference of over 10,000 times when you compare the solid state to the liquid state batteries. Therefore, for the solid state batteries, we believe that it will be a long way before we can really see them being applied to electric vehicles. For these two Japanese companies, they are using uh, they are using the high nickel ternary cathode materials and special materials for the cathodes as their core technology. And these are the latest uh, development trends. And uh, you could see the launch time of all these different uh, batteries by these, ma by these manufacturers are actually within the last two years. And here, we, I'm showing you a cross-section of a lithium polymer battery. Bolero launched the first commercial lithium polymer battery in 2011. It is a solid electrolyte using PEO and lithium salts. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I showed you the technical routes, three different technical routes. Of course, they each have their own advantages and disadvantages, which I have already explained. For the time being, I think the most physical uh, route is to go for the semi-solid state. What this means is that you could use uh, porous materials or polymers or gel types of materials mixed with uh, traditional electrolytes. But you need to reduce the, the content of electrolyte in order to enhance its level of safety. And it would be able to withstand high temperatures and pressure. Like I said, um, a recent um, a news story came out about solid state semi-solid state batteries used in EVs. In 2022, Ganfeng Lithium Company in China, uh, they showcased a quasi-solid state batteries and they in fact delivered 50 demonstration vehicles to the market. And in fact, a, their technology is very similar to this Taiwanese company that is producing the same type of batteries. At Gus, our, our company in fact, uh, is also researching this type of uh, semi-solid state batteries, but we have not launched our findings. We have talked enough about uh, lithium batteries and their different types and advantages. Now, a little bit about GUS. GUS technology focuses on the development and, and application of various normal materials and battery cells. We work with a Japanese partner to tap into lithium battery cell manufacturing. We have this one gigawatt production facility in Zhongli, Taoyuan County. So this is an e equivalent to 10,000 of uh, EVs. If we look at uh, MHEV batteries uh, design as the foundation, then we may be able to, uh, we may be uh, able to supply uh, 2 million cars. We focus on oxides-based batteries, such as these ones. For example, the NCM batteries uh, with long driving range on the left-hand side. However, if your mileage can be predetermined and uh, it does not and then your usage does not involve long or long distance. You can go for quick charging, quick discharge. Uh, for example, here we have e-bus and also mild hybrid electric vehicles, AGVs, AFCs, etc. on the right hand side. So why does GUS focus on LTO batteries? Because it has long cycle life, efficient fast charge and discharge, um, 
and it's it's set at 7C to 7.5C, very fast charging, outstanding safety, high rating, and it could at peak time it could go up to 20C. The lithium cells can really withstand that kind of fast charging, and it also has wide working temperature range. Uh, whenever it's in a snowy condition, in high temperature condition, this is something that the, some other lithium battery cells are not able to withstand. The, here I'm showing you the electrochemical variation. Lithium is inserted into a solid 3D structure unlike interlocution during charging. There's no SEI, therefore no activation step is required. Lower first cycle irreversibility is also one characteristic, meaning that there is a less loss of active lithium. As you can see, the lithium particles are randomly uh, roaming around. So in the traditional uh, batteries, uh, you have uh, the lithium branch information. However, uh, with our model, there's no lithium branch information. An LTO cell also offers uh, re better remaining capacity. There's about 91% of remaining capacity after 8,000 cycles. And such batteries can be quickly charged and discharged. Like I said, uh, in the puncturing experimentation, such batteries are able to continue discharging without any uh, accidents. As you can see, the, the nails are still uh, visible in the pouch. However, the battery goes on offering excellent safety. Like I said, we're going here, we have temperatures uh, from negative 40 to positive 75 Celsius, a wide working temperature range. Here we have more statistics to show you the LTO cell overcharge and discharge cycling tests. So 100% can be retained, and the overcharging does not cause loss or damages to the battery cells. Now you can see that our cells are being used in these uh, areas. We have the containers, three-wheel electric scooters are using our cells as well. We also uh, offer, it, it, they are also used in power banks. So they're used in HEVs, uh, in the, and when it comes to the NCM batteries, um, it's different from what Tesla's approach. In with Tesla, in a higher range models, for example, Model Three, Model Y, they're still using a lead acid batteries, and they eventually moved to LP. LFP batteries, but we believe that the future will be in the able hands of LTO and NCM batteries. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. This concludes the morning session, so you can see the QR code on the screen. You can scan the QR code and please fill out the online questionnaire for us. Once again, thank you very much for your participation. Our afternoon session will start at 2 p.m. So we'll open for registration at 1.30. So please enjoy the lunch break and come back at 2 p.m. Thank you very much.
转染非常重要哈。它的题材提到的是智慧跟电动化。那透过这一个平台呢，如果年复一年的办理，就会把台湾这个产业啊，很完整的带到全球。在这次的展览，我们展出了三个东西。第一个是我们的自驾审核解决方案，那第二个呢是我们的车队管理方案，那第三个就是后面看到的我们的自驾车的实车。也很谢谢冒险这次举办这样子的一个展览，能够让我们这些业界先进的能够在这个展览上面做一些互相的交流以及接触。大概有跟大概四间左右的买主洽谈，这样。那国家的话，可能有日本，然后有这个越南，然后还有一个是波兰，这样。哦，我觉得蛮好的，就是呃，因为透过视讯洽谈会，因为其实主要是因为疫情的关系，可以透过像外贸协会这样子的一个平台。那对我们来说，其实我们也是认识新的客户。有一个很特别的事情是说，现在在波兰这边，因为他跟我们的一些接触比较少，所以他对于说可以透过在疫情期间可以透过这样的方式啊，他觉得。非常的兴奋，也非常感动，甚至像在明年疫情之后，他想要亲自来访台湾。电子食品に全体的には電子食品に興味あるんですけども、その中でも V2X と呼ばれるあの車と車と物の通信関係ですね、製品、あるいは家出す自動運転ですね、今は部品とかモジュールとかアンテナ通信のシステムに興味があります。Actually, I met、um, several companies with different.、Um, Focus、um, of this branch in this branch, and I think、um, uh, the Taiwanese companies are well prepared.、Oh. They、um, they developing、um, the market and、um, own product policy on a solid base、uh, because、um, they are、um, working in all directions, like testing, like producing、um, of、uh, different products. 觉得非常的棒，这里聚集了台湾所有的大型的厂商，然后一次让你可以看到所有人的产品，然后一次可以做一个整个完整的各式各样的比较，然后去选择适合自己的。我个人对于之后的电动车和自驾车其实是非常看好的。And Taiwan,、uh, from experience as an engineer, Taiwan has lots of companies which have very high expertise in this sector. They have high technology. Good costs and good quality. Actually, we expect that by 2030, the electric car will be the third of the electric car in the world. So, actually, from the standpoint of the electric car, this is a new kind of electric car shift. The electric car will Taipei MR and Autotronic Taipei. We offer opportunities and inspirations to see the future of auto and motor technology components.
Taiwan is an awesome place to find suitable qualified manufacturers. APA show is really truly the only one show for all the suppliers, all the manufacturers to get together to catch up on the new items to co work for the future. We get really good quality to show how stable that Taiwanese people get consistent to the whole world. It's good, really, actually, it's good. I just look around here to see what kind of an autobots product for the African people. I actually can find so many interesting products for the Spanish companies. We meet very good suppliers here and very good partners. Now is Taiwan's chance to become a global component supplier. 在电动车的领域上呢，台湾包括像这个散热组件，还有包括充电的呃设施，台湾其实另外一座护国神山正慢慢在形成。几乎所有的厂商呢，基本上都走向 ESG 这个环保的原最高原则的方向了。其实我们在这个 ESG 这方面，其实有一直不断的做努力啦。我们也吸引到很多有关于这样的一个客户，包含一些欧美大厂啊。Also, this time we take advantage of Empa Online, expand the exposure of Taiwan quality to the whole world. 它的网页的设计哈也是非常的一个流畅，在家哈都可以就是完整充分的去了解到现场的一个情况。因为现在我们想要参与这个线下展会是非常困难的嘛。It's a good chance for us to look for new suppliers. Interesting possibilities to follow up. It's a good marketplace to work. We, because we participated in the Empa Expo, in using this machine, we also got a lot of opportunities. It increased about three times the revenue. 每年来参加都有一定的成果，可以在短短的四天之内接触到非常非常多国的不同的客人。我相信全世界就看到台湾的优良产品。Empa is one of the biggest exhibition for auto parts in the world. If you get a chance to come to Taiwan, you got to visit Empa. 我觉得其实看展最有温度就是来到现场，你也可以知道整个产业的节奏。Electronics and the LT Taiwan 2022 will be exhibiting at Nangang Exhibition Center Ho Wan from October 26 to 28 and be held virtually until November 8. These two shows will also be held concurrently with TPCA Show Taipei and Up to Taiwan. Good morning, Coco. Welcome to Syscom. I see that you are with NetMaker. Please follow me. Our senior director, Max, is waiting for you. Welcome, Welcome to the Electronics and AOT Taiwan 2022 show. Please visit us at AO509A. Hi, everyone. My name is Libby, business development manager of Panasonic Taiwan. You can experience Panasonic's mixed reality system, AMR robotics, solutions, and the AI technology at our booth. Can't wait to see you in AIoT Taiwan. This year, for Titanics, we have provided solutions for these three areas. The first one, you get it. We have provided solar power testing solution. And for the second one, Automotive electronic, we have provided ISO 16750-2, let's blow. And the last one, battery management system, we have provided charging and discharging for batteries. In addition, there will be many events during the shows this year, such as the IoT Application Forum and Procurement Meetings. Please register now and see you at the show ground.
Seeing everyone in person next year. See you next year at Computex 2023. Thank you. 大概有跟大概四间左右的买主洽谈这样那国家的话可能有日本然后有这个越南然后还有一个是波兰这样我觉得蛮好的就是因为透过视讯洽谈会因为其实主要是因为疫情的关系可以透过像外贸协会这样子
得非常的棒。这里聚集了台湾所有的大型的厂商，然后一次让你可以看到所有人的产品，然后一次可以做一个整个完整的各式各样的比较，然后去选择适合自己的。我个人对于之后的电动车和自驾车其实是非常看好的。And Taiwan,、uh, from experience as an engineer, Taiwan has lots of companies which have very high expertise in this sector. They have high technology, good costs, and good quality. Actually, we expect in 2030, 台北 M R and Auto Tonic Taipei. We offer opportunities and inspirations to see the future of auto and motor technology component. Taiwan is an awesome place to find suitable, qualified manufacturers. Epa Show is really, truly the only one show for all the suppliers, all the manufacturers to get together to catch up on the new items to co-work for the future. We get really good quality to show how stable that Taiwanese people is consistent to the whole world. It's good, really. Actually, it's good. I just look around here to see what kind of an autobots products for us African people. I actually can find so many interesting products for the Spanish companies. We need very good suppliers here and very good partners. Now is Taiwan's chance to become a global component supplier. 在电动车的领域上呢，台湾包括像这个散热组件，还有包括充电的呃设施，台湾其实另外一座护国神山正慢慢在形成。几乎所有的厂商呢，基本上都走向 ESG 这个环保的原最高原则的方向。其实我们在这个 ESG 这方面，其实有一直不断的做努力啦。我们也吸引到很多有关于这样的一个客户，包含一些欧美大厂啊。So this time we we'll take advantage of Empower Online, expand the exposure of Taiwan quality to the whole world. Its website design is also a very flowing process. At home, you can easily and completely understand the situation. Now we want to participate in this virtual event. It's a good chance for us to look for new suppliers. There's a lot of interesting possibilities to follow up. It's a good marketplace to work with. Empower is one of the biggest exhibition for auto parts in the world. If you get a chance to come to Taiwan, you got to visit Empower. 我觉得其实看展最有温度就是来到现场，你也可以知道整个产业的节奏。Tronics and the LT Taiwan 2022 will be exhibiting at the Nangang Exhibition Center Ho Wan from October 26 to 28 and be held virtually until November 8. These two shows will also be held concurrently with TPCA Show Taipei and Up to Taiwan.
Good morning, Coco. Welcome to Syscom. I see that you are with NetMaker. Please follow me. Our senior director, Max, is waiting for you. Welcome, Welcome to Titanic and AOT Taiwan 2022 show. Please visit us at AO509A. Hi, everyone. My name is Libby, business development manager of Panasonic Taiwan. You can experience Panasonic's mixed reality system, AMR robotics solutions, and the AI technology at our booth. Can't wait to see you in AIoT Taiwan. This year, for Titanic, we have provided solutions for these three areas. The first one, you get it. We have provided solar power testing solution. And for the second one, automotive electronic, we have provided ISO 16750-2. Let's look. And the last one, battery management system, we have provided charging and discharging for batteries. In addition, there will be many events during the shows this year, such as the IoT Application Forum and Procurement Meetings. Please register now and see you at the show ground. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and online viewers from around the world. The 2022 e-mobility forum will begin momentarily, so please be seated. Please make sure to, mo to mute your mobile phone before the program begins, and please keep your mask on at all times. Thank you for your cooperation.
Bloomberg, Taiwan is at the crossroads of the global tech supply chain. Seeing everyone in person next year. See you next year at Computex 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, and online view viewers from around the world, welcome to the 2022 e-mobility forum. We have four presentations in the afternoon. This, this afternoon, we will discuss how the ICT industry and entrepreneurs can leverage their expertise to accelerate the transformation of the automotive industry through new technologies. We will also look at how startups are disrupting this entire industry and its supply chain. First, we have the co-founder of Mosaic Venture Lab, Volker Heistermann. He is committed to nurturing startups and promoting smart mobility and transportation electrification. He will talk about how startups are disrupting the automotive industry. I think none of us would be here today in this forum if it wasn't for a startup, uh, Tesla, and uh, Tesla disrupted things. I myself has, have worked at startups and with startups for actually the last 20 years. I just realized that sitting there, I worked at Google when it was still a startup in the early 2000s, and then I moved over to an investment bank, and uh, I have come in and out of Taiwan uh, since 2011, and actually helped build the startup ecosystem here uh, when it was very young and fresh, 2011, 2012. And then more recently, we have been focused on the mobility sector, and that's why I'm here today. And what you're gonna get out of this talk today um, are the two points, and that is which startups are actually relevant for the car industry, because there is so much that can be done from an innovation perspective. And then what does it mean for you? Let me ask, uh, who, are, who is the audience here? Who is a supplier, a traditional supplier, uh, like a SME or a larger company like a Delta? Who supplies, um, anybody here works for supply for the supply chain industry? Raise your hand, please. Anybody, suppliers? Okay, a few. Any startups here? Okay, investors? Get your checkbooks out. There are some startups. Okay, so as you can see, for the mobility and um, automotive industry, there are by far more than 2,000. But 2,000 are being tracked, 2,000 startups. And uh, that's quite a jungle. And so if you are a corporation, how do, how do you actually navigate this jungle, and also, where do you partner uh, with startups to make your products more innovative? And for startups, who do you choose to work with in order to accomplish your goal of growing bigger and outgrowing the startup phase? So, when you enter the auto industry, uh, the, the traditional suppliers, and especially the OEMs, the car brands, um, have been disrupted vigorously, just like the telecom industry 20 years ago, they were one of the first industries to be affected by the internet and disruption. Uh, I worked at AT&T at the time. But now, when you think of the auto industry, and uh, let's use Volkswagen Group as an example with the Carriot uh, software that uh, they have launched and have been, you know, in, in some ways struggling with. But what is the challenge here? When you think in the old days, a car manufacturer would sell the car and once it's off the lot, make some money from the servicing. Sometimes there were recalls, but that were the only expenditures. But now, and Tesla has set the stage with over-the-air updates of software and the car being a software-defined vehicle, uh, Volkswagen has to maintain not only the spare parts and store them, but upgrade the software for the lifespan of the vehicle, which is a tremendous expenditure. We're talking of billions of dollars in development costs, and the users, the, the buyers, the drivers, and passengers are not really interested 
in paying any of these updates over time. So that's why, or one of the reasons why the car industry is having to find new business models to even pay for the maintenance of the software to keep it up to date. And uh, that is where I want to spend part of this talk in uh, sharing with you how startups are jumping from zero stage. Uh, in one case, I have one example today that's really exciting. We work with a startup all the way to the sea level at Daimler, which took about four years. Uh, and uh, providing a critical software now for every Mercedes that's being shipped that was announced this summer. But so the areas that are of interest and that you want to look at uh, are the connectivity, uh, anything that's V2X related, um, and uh, on the supply chain side, uh, we are looking, especially interesting for Taiwan, we get to that in a moment, uh, and the cabin intelligence. And then also a topic for Taiwan uh, is electrification of course, but you see on the very left, sustainability is the absolute most critical element. And that is something that Taiwan has been really, I want to say, woken up to over the last two or three years. I've been here during the COVID the entire time. And uh, because the, the car makers, the buyers, the young people that grow up today, uh, that purchase the vehicles, they will demand a clean vehicle. And that is being pushed all the way upstream, you know, to the gold mine in Africa uh, where, the, where the materials uh, are sourced. So sustainability is something that you have to really focus on. Let's look at this, the spending for the sector. Um, over 20 billion US dollars, despite the downturn, have been invested in the uh, industry. Um, the deal count from CV Insights uh, was mid last year. Uh, that's the latest uh, data available. It was about 212 deals, but that's a lot of money. So let's, let's actually take a look at what areas um, are interesting. And that might be for, for the corporations here also um, uh, worth exploring where do you put your money, uh, where is uh, an investment you want to make that you don't want to outsource, that you don't want to develop in-house, where you can work with a startup potentially, um, or invest in the startups to complement your product offerings. And uh, the biggest bubble is which is very dear to Taiwan, uh, actually the radar side, radar and cameras. Uh, we, we were working with a startup uh, four years ago and a Taiwan supplier, Strat Vision from Korea. Uh, they were very tiny at the time, but today ZF, one of the big German suppliers, uh, has taken a, a very big equity stake and they're in 40 cars and 13 car brands uh, with their autonomous software. So this is not just the hardware side, it's also the software side. And then mapping, of course, is uh, interested. in on the connectivity side, it's V2X. Uh, startups are very strong when it comes to cybersecurity. It's not necessarily one of Taiwan's strongholds, uh, but Israel is where you want to take a look at startups if that's something where you need to complement uh, your current offerings. I do know that Trend Micro in Taiwan actually does have a um, car uh, cybersecurity startup division or spin out as well. And then electrification. Again, very, very key to you here in the audience. Uh, this is where investments are taking place. Uh, and then also uh, smart mobility um, at a smaller spending. Blockchain actually is very interesting. It's very, very tiny. We know that Bitcoin has been um, plummeting the last couple of months, but there's also not so much investment uh, taking place on the blockchain side of things. Now, it's not just about investing. Uh, it's actually in our program, Mosaic is uh, the exclusive partner uh, in Taiwan for Continental. Uh, many of you may know Continental as a tire company, but only 20% of their revenues are actually tires. Uh, the rest, related to exciting innovation areas that I just showed you on the, on the slide earlier, especially when it comes to the cabin. A large percentage um, of all cars shipped globally um, have screens that are powered by Continental uh, in the vehicle. And so you can imagine that the company is looking uh, globally uh, and what are the emerging business models for the cabin and what are the technologies such as micro LEDs uh, heads-up displays, of course, augmented reality heads-up displays, and where is that technology? And so they launched uh, a unit called Copace, which is headquartered in Germany, uh, has units in Israel, in, uh, in Beijing, or uh, in Shanghai, uh, in Singapore. 
uh, and in some other places uh, in the US. Um, we are the Taiwan partner, they don't have a presence in Taiwan yet, and we are working with suppliers here, uh, looking at the supply chain and also especially at startup companies. And I give you three examples that have been on our, on our radar here. One is a Taiwan startup that's producing a MEMS-based micro, uh, very small speaker uh, that could potentially be integrated in the headrest and in the car, uh, and it will save weight because it will cut back on the copper that's usually in, in the speakers. So sustainability, again, is a factor here. Uh, and then the next one is on the NPU side. Uh, that's a hardcore Taiwan native chip startup, uh, been powered by, by TSMC. Uh, and then uh, the third one uh, is actually for the digital cockpit, uh, how you can uh, enhance the user experience in the cockpit. But this is how you as a supplier or you as a startup can collaborate with the industry. And don't just look for money uh, as a startup. Uh, look at what the investor can provide if it's a corporate investor beyond just the cash. And the topic here is uh, POCs, proof of concepts. Right? That's how it usually starts. Uh, it's like dating, uh, getting to know each other through a POC. Uh, it's not a high expenditure for the corporate. Usually it's maybe 10,000 US dollars, 20, 50. Um, well, the POC I'm going to show you in a little bit was actually a million dollars, but that was um, a U.S. startup with a, a German automaker. So sometimes the POCs can be really expensive as well. Depends on how critical it is and what the technology uh, is uh, uh, that is there. Now, <laughs> well, well, it's a six months stand, so I don't know. It's 189. <laughs> <laughs> Usually like, right? Uh, I do appreciate the interactivity. Uh, we can't interact with our online audience, but please, anytime, raise your hand uh, and ask questions. And we'll have a five-minute Q&A uh, towards the end as well. Uh, so here uh, you're seeing, and I want to bring this back again, sustainability. If, if you want to get uh, purchase orders from the car industry in a few years and you're not sustainable and your suppliers are not sustainable, your startup is not sustainable, you're not going to get the purchase orders. This is very rigorous now and here I'm presenting to you the, the roadmap uh, from Daimler, BMW and Volkswagen. Uh, we especially focus on the German car market but we also work with North American car companies and uh, you see here uh, the investment is 73 billion um, and that's till 2025. Huge amounts of money uh, and uh, a CO2 neutral goal, of course, by 2050 for Volkswagen and the European Union. So uh, very, very critical that you don't forget sustainability in your sales pitches, uh, in your RFQs, uh, requests for proposals that you're answering. So now, what is the opportunity for Taiwan here? And how much time do we have left? About 12 minutes, okay. We all know the story, we do. But let me tell you, when we set up our program Mosaic, and I went to Germany four times in 2019 before the pandemic, rented a car and drove and visited all the uh, tier ones, the leading tier ones, Bosch and you know Continental, and the end result is Continental is now sponsoring our program here. But it was very difficult to get the ears of the executives, and since we're dealing with innovation, we always deal with the executive level at the, at the uh, vendor side. It was very difficult to uh, make them um, understand, buy into why Taiwan matters. Well, then fast forward, we had the, the COVID pandemic and uh, the semiconductor crisis, and now all of a sudden Taiwan is a household name, but still not necessarily for all the products that you are making. Uh, and, and I think that's why you're here at the Formality Forum. You're looking to find ways how you can fast track your products into a Volkswagen, into a Daimler, into a GM. And in a moment, I'm going to share with you how one fast track could work. So what Tesla started here, and this is a government provided number, 75%. When I talk to industry experts here in Taiwan, it's more 15 to 20% critical components. Well, that's a huge number, given how many countries there are on the planet. Uh, so now this is how you want to move up. Uh, you're in, usually in Taiwan tier twos, tier threes. And the goal is to become uh, either tier 0.5 tier 0 or tier 1.5. Or in some cases, you're already tier 1s. Um, but for a lot of you, um, and for startups as well, that is a long road. Now, our suggestion is that, and I just mentioned Stratvision from Korea earlier, that you team up 
uh, and uh, we, we worked with the Taiwan um, hardware, a big, big company here in Taiwan on this, on this POC. And uh, the goal was to equip the Taiwan hardware makers, the Taiwan suppliers, the tier two's hardware, uh, to enhance that with software, with Stratvision software. Because Stratvision was already engaging with, in executive conversations with car makers, and that's 2018, years ago around the world. And uh, so if you team up and combine those, ch those, those um, strengths, then you can actually uh, raise quicker to a tier 1.5 or maybe even tier 1. Uh, so by adding more innovation to your products, in many ways it's software, which is not necessarily Taiwan's strength, but bringing this back to Taiwan and our story, when we talk to the car makers around the world, come to Taiwan, you're interested in the chip level, and here we have the experts that are able to integrate software and hardware you know, at the foundation. Uh, and so that is, you know, one of the stories uh, for Taiwan to advocate to the industry. Now let's look at three areas, I mentioned them earlier, that are interesting uh, and very native to Taiwan, and that's in-cabin intelligence. And this is a very critical one, that some of the tier ones that are a little bit, you know, like worried about their future of being squeezed from the tier twos and the OEMs. It's like co-opetition. Uh, the cabin is one of the playgrounds. Uh, and again, Tesla has been, you know, pushing the over-the-air upgrades, software upgrades, and uh, been very, very progressive. But here you can see some Taiwan companies, both on the startup side and on the corporate side, where especially in AUO uh, is a very good storyteller, having C-level conversations at the OEMs in Europe and in North America uh, and, and really leading the pack with the innovation. And then taking along the startups like Play Need Ride, right, that just I think went IPO, uh, that is providing micro LEDs. And so that's a, like a nice partnership there. But this is the area in vehicle payments, money, transactions, the battle for the ownership. Just like with the mobile phones 20 years ago, the, uh, the carriers uh, wanted the ownership um, or the credit card companies, right? So the car companies, and now we're gonna get to the next slide, are really trying to keep Google and Apple out of the car. Your iPhone, your Android phone, um, it's not necessarily what the car industry likes to have in the car because they want the ownership. And this is the, uh, what I mentioned to you, the fast track. This lady I found through a scouting project from Audi, 2018 on Madison Avenue, she was working in the advertising industry and the topic was the, um, the um, intelligent, the um, um, empathic vehicle. Uh, so we worked on a POC together and it took years and then Porsche invested three and a half million in her and then the journey continued and in the end, um, she has launched this summer um, a premium in-car interactive experiences, uh, experience, a software and content that is going on every Mercedes-Benz and in the future in other car companies because they're all coming after her. But it was very hard and we tried to raise money for her in Taiwan. We knew she was going to get the purchase order from Daimler, but you know, she has 10, 10, 10 employees or so. And then we went to the co companies in Taiwan and even in Silicon Valley. They're like, how can you do this? How can you ever you know, become a tier one for Daimler? How can you accomplish this? Bypassing Bosch, bypassing Continental. But she did it. And if you piggyback and invest and tag along with a startup that is working on cutting edge innovation, then you're immediately on the fast track to Volkswagen's supplier portal. If you go on and type in, on the internet, Volkswagen supplier fast track, they have a fast track program and that's for highly innovative companies. Otherwise it will take you millions of dollars in spending on consulting fees uh, and getting ready uh, and years un until you get that RFQ from like the big giant OEMs. But if you actually have a highly innovative product, not just a me too, that is already in the supply chain uh, with existing relationships. But if you team up with a startup or you spin out business units, you have great talents in your companies and you look 
at what the companies need, and we're going to get back the, uh, what, what they're looking for, uh, and innovate there, then you are actually getting much faster to the purchase order. So electrification is another topic for Taiwan. Uh, Delta, of course, has been spearheading the pack here for 10 years, working you know, with the car industry in Europe and North America, and have uh, good success. And uh, so powertrain is a topic for Taiwan, and here are some startups uh, that are, uh, again, native to Taiwan that we're working with and uh, working to help them uh, accelerate. Uh, augmented reality, another interesting topic, uh, but as we're getting closer to the end of my talk and I wanted to open the room for more questions, um, I'm going to fast forward through this. This is what I'm using also to sell Taiwan to the car industry outside Taiwan. Say, look, the e ink from Daimler, everybody talked about it a few months ago, right? It was actually made in Taiwan. People don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm BMW, I'm, I apologize, not Daimler. Uh, and the micro LED is a very, very hot topic. So, now, this is what's important. Do your homework. As a tier two supplier, you're very far away from the strategy from the sea level uh, in the car companies. And try to get access to what these companies are looking for. And actually in my earlier slides and on this slides, you can see, this is a snapshot, and, and we have these type of slides from Daimler, from BMW, from all the bigger car companies. We know their innovation topics, we know exactly what they're looking for to complement their existing capabilities, to either develop it in-house or to develop it um, out, outside with startups um, in, in co-innovation co through programs like CoPace. But that is you know, key for you to speak their language and when you want to get on that fast track I mentioned, then this is what they're, what they're looking for in terms of solutions. So our program is uh, Mosaic Venture Lab, we're based in Taiwan and in Germany. And I've myself been in San Francisco for a long time. I mentioned earlier, I have been in Taiwan since 2011 and been laser focused on the car industry since 2015. Uh, done a lot of work here and our program is working um, on sourcing startups. Um, we're looking at a thousand and more a year uh, and then to work on POCs, design in, POCs, and then we don't do the certification, but of course we work with the DECROS of the world and TÜVs um, on uh, the certification requirements. So we have a team in Germany that's actually from the car industry that can help the factories to get ready um, outside um, uh, Taiwan and then the commercialization part. Um, I'm just going to skip through the rest of it here and um, open it up. This is our team. Uh, open it up for questions. Uh, these are just some of the companies that we have working relationships with, but there are of course a lot more, because uh, that's what we do. Uh, we connect people, and uh, we believe the future of the EV supply chain is collaborative, which means, yes, you can invest in startups, but you can also work with them to accelerate your path to more RFQs. So I'm at the end of my presentation, and uh, I wanted to see if you have um, any questions, and I hope you do, because I believe we have a few minutes left. Let's see, uh, yeah, about eight minutes left. And uh, can we take online questions as well from our online audience? So don't be shy. There must be some questions. No? Yes. Hi. Um, it depends on how microscopic you want to go. I was just in San Francisco last week and I met with a startup called Lit Motors uh, that invest, it got received and we are working with them actually also on fundraising. They're raising a $10 million round right now. And we're looking here also at Taiwan. Uh, Larry Page invested in them uh, as an example and it's a two-wheel um, mobility solution. Not just micro-mobility, but it's actually taking two of the wheels away and providing an incredible experience. They have lots of patents. The patent portfolio is valued over $10 million and they've been around for a while. And this company actually um, has patents that you can tip this vehicle over. It's just really fascinating. Um, and yes, uh, the Lit Motors has actually on the concept and on the, on the feasibility study in terms of usability, 
uh, and is the market interested uh, in such a mobility solution worked with a leading uh, German premium, I can't tell you which one, but a German premium car brand. And that was actually through one of our scouting projects. Uh, we were retained to find micromobility solutions because you know that the Bosches of the world now also sell scooters, uh, little e-scooters. And so yes, uh, they're all looking uh, all the way from the four bigger cars uh, down to the micromobility solution. But that's how as a startup you can plug in if you have the relationships and actually use um, that you know, marketing capability and R&D and research cap capability um, from these car companies uh, if they feel like they don't want to build it in-house. And in this case, Lit Motors has these amazing patents. You know, I encourage you guys to Google it. It's fascinating. And uh, the, uh, I have five minutes left. Okay, the owner, actually, the founder, uh, has built his own vehicle as well. He's quite famous in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, any other question? Yes, gentlemen. You know, it's a great question. I was on a panel in Berlin, and you know, I'm the disruptor. I'm like, you know, our company doesn't have a global. What What's my opinion on autonomous vehicles? <laughs> well, Wait, when do you think the autonomy autonomy drive will come true, and what are the missing? Well, you know, today was just bad news uh, that Ford and um, Volkswagen just slashed their autonomous uh, project. That was just in the news. Uh, I was on a panel in Berlin just before COVID, and uh, I was a little nervous, to be honest. I had a, like a very senior Daimler guy next to me and uh, a, a very famous car startup. And here I'm the guy, you know, from Mosaic Venture Lab that was not very well known in Germany in 2019. We had just started the program here. And um, I decided to be honest and uh, voice my opinion. And uh, when the question came in 2019, uh, what do you think of autonomous? And I said, it's not attainable because the last 5% or so is gonna be the, the, the biggest hurdle, right? Uh, it's easy to get things going in a, in a, um, in a campus, in a university, uh, but once you, you're out there in the wild west in the city traffic of Taipei, that very last mile, so to speak, uh, is, is very difficult to achieve. And uh, I was the only one on the panel, and, uh, yeah, but however, I think years later now, we're seeing that uh, it is very, very difficult uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, autonomy, an, an autonomous uh, vehicle uh, with a roadmap that the car executives presented at CES uh, in 2015, 16, 17, and spending hundreds of billions of dollars. However, it's not stopping, and uh, as we know, uh, it's already underway. Uh, there's an autonomous shuttle uh, driving at nighttime in, in Chini, or there was at least. Uh, but so it's a question of what level of autonomy. Like 100% everything autonomous? Um, not in the near future. Uh, I don't think so. I still don't think so. Any other questions? Yes. The, the, the one night stand man. <laughs> My question is quite different from the, the, the thing. main thing is that do you consider yourself as a celebrity in this industry? Um, yes. The closest I have ever been to a celebrity was 2011 and 12 when I started at the time Yushan Ventures. Um, there was Jamie Lin from AppWorks and there was Yushan Ventures and TMI Labs. We were the only people. I was the first foreigner here coming to Taiwan investing in startups and just really working hard um, on creating a startup ecosystem. And at the time, I do think I had a little bit of in the ecosystem of a status that people knew me, but today, not at all. I wish. Maybe I don't want to be a celebrity, but no, I'm not a celebrity. Thank you. Any other questions? That was an interesting question, by the way. One more. We have one, one more question here. One last one. Anyone? Yeah, there you go. It's on. Just curious if you have the experience with Korea or Japanese customers from the touring industries. So Korea is more aggressive, but I, I'm not sure why Japanese people just just stay away from. I, I have a lot of experience because we have run scouting startup scouting projects for the German car industry in Korea and in Japan in 2016, 17, and 18. And I can tell you, uh, 
we were not always uh, very welcome. <laughs> There's a lot of national pride, um, both from the startups uh, as much as from, of course, from the Toyotas of the world or so. Uh, yes, of course, uh, I, I have engaged with Toyota in the past uh, and also with Hyundai. As a matter of fact, Copay's Continental's program is working very closely with Hyundai uh, in Korea. So my colleague is flying to Korea next week. We are very uh, engaged and active in Korea, but the culture uh, is quite different from Taiwan and even different from Japan. And uh, that is on the topic of how do you work with startups. Uh, there is not just the money part, there's also cultural barriers in some cases uh, you want to consider. Um, but uh, these uh, Korean car companies have come you know, from not such great cars to really wonderful cars. Uh, I can only say that. And that's exactly the model that Japan took. When you think of the Japanese cars 20 years ago, they were just a laughing stock. And you know, I've owned a few Toyotas over the years. And uh, I, I think both countries have really um, um, opted up the game. And, and in some cases, I know Hyundai has hired executives from the German car industry uh, to enhance their ADAS capabilities, uh, for example. Uh, and I've had a rental car last summer in, uh, in the US, and I turned it into an autonomous vehicle on the freeways. I can tell you by uh, playing with, with all the features it had, it was just fascinating, just cruising down the roads, not touching anything, or only every three minutes. <laughs> So, uh, very fascinating, uh, no question. It's not just about the Germans, um, uh, but they're also not, not asleep any longer. Thank you very much, and I wish all of the suppliers best of luck. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities for you uh, that, in some cases, the Europeans, North Americans are not aware of that, that you should be the customer uh, and the supplier. And please make it happen, and for the startups and investors, you know, grow bigger. Uh, thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands once again for our very wonderful speaker, Volker Hasterman. Thank you so much for your very informative, very thought-provoking talk, and thank you very much for the very inspiring QA. Thank you. We would like to thank the co-founder of Mosaic Venture Lab, Volker Hasterman. As vehicles move towards electrification, Semiconductor companies can effectively assist automakers in accelerating development while making electric vehicles more affordable. The next speaker will be Jasper Chan. He's the sales area director of the Texas Instruments. Let's welcome him. Hi everyone, my name is Jasper Chan. I am responsible for the sales of the entire company. I'm also responsible for uh, accelerating the use of a semiconductor chips in EVs. In the past uh, decade, we see that semiconductors have played a very important role in accelerating the EV market. And we believe that it will be the same for the next decade. We see that the market for EVs is about 20 million units. We believe that uh, by 2025 or 2030, the entire EV market could uh, be uh, exceeding 50 to 60 million units, which will account for more than half of the entire sales around the world. In 2035, in Europe as well as in the United States, there are there will be uh, stricter regulations and laws limiting the sales of uh, fossil fuel vehicles. So we see that the trends are continuing and causing a paradigm shift for in, from in cabin uh, experience to all the onboard uh, softwares and hardwares, we see a rapid change toward the larger panels, larger screens. You will see in the future that uh, EVs will have multiple screens, large screens, uh, to enhance the uh, in-cabin experience. My friend recently uh, uh, test drove in the United States, the Google um, electric car. In, in fact, uh, the Wemo taxi uh, was uh, was uh, being operated with autonomous driving, and there was no driver behind the driving wheel, and my friend was able to make an extra stop at a McDonald's restaurant to pick up some food on the way from the uh, point of departure all the way to the airport. So we see that changes are happening, and all Autonomous driving uh, is rapidly moving 
、uh, center stage. However, before we realize our visions, we face the following challenges. First, functional safety and、uh, cybersecurity in autonomous driving or in semi-autonomous driving. How do we increase?、Um, how do we hand ourselves、uh, to the autonomous car driving mechanism? And、uh, how can we feel that we can entirely trust the, the driving mechanism? So there's also the cost、uh, factor. Uh, will the price of the EVs be closer to the fossil fuel vehicles in the future, and how quickly will that happen? And there's also the continuous innovation demands. The machine-human interface will continue to evolve, and、uh, we need to look into how the use of the latest semiconductor technologies will be able to accelerate that. And there is also an, a demand for the shorter time to market. And there's also the concern of various worldwide regulations, whether it's assisted driving or fully autonomous driving. Different countries have different laws and regulations. And in terms of this, we still have a very long way to go. As the previous speaker has mentioned, that、uh, we see that all these markets are shifting, and that these laws are being、uh, updated、uh, as we speak. There's a lot of tier one.、Um, Or tier 1.5 players, and there's more and more of them. And many car brands are deciding on solutions. For example, the chip solution, semiconductor solution, and the kind of specs they are choosing. Once they're they're choosing from. In the past, these were determined by tier one, but in the future, we see a huge、um, supply chain change. So there's the cost concern. There's a time to market challenge. There is the challenge of being compliant with various worldwide regulations. These are all the、uh, challenges that we face today. So in this area, starting from the 1990s, we started to provide various qualified vehicle. Products. We continue with our R and D because all of the functional safety and system integration. It's not just built upon one single chip. From different perspectives, from electronics, power to the informatics. I think from the chips and from the system, TI has tried our very best to provide better products and effect changes for our customers. According to some market survey, we know that why EV cannot be widely adopted. There are two main reasons. The first is the driving range anxiety. Some people just told me that in Taiwan, if they want to purchase EV, they hope that they can drive the car from Taipei to Kaohsiung and back to Taipei. They don't need to charge. Then, what kind of challenge is that? The first one is the battery challenge, the time for batteries and the efficiency of charging, and also the increase of energy efficiency. The second one will be the cost. So, can the cost be closer to the price or the cost of the fuel cars? That is the challenge that we will have to face and overcome in the next few years. So, from the perspective of chips, on the upper left, you can see that for a fuel car, that will be the oil tank. But now, we can put the cells under the chassis of the cars. What kind of change will it make? In addition to the capacity of the cells, the measurement of cell will be critically important because if there is a several percentage of errors, then the computer may make wrong decision. So the system would tell me, "I'm running out of juice. Maybe in five minutes I can run for another twenty kilometers, then I will be out of battery." So battery monitoring will require high efficiency. Also different from traditional fuel cars, the linkage of the cells is critical important. So for every cell, we need to measure the power left, so the total weight combined, as well as the lines com transmission. They can be laid out together under the car, 
So we need to consider not only the weight of the cells, but also the weight of the lines, and all these will lead to the、um, change in the driving range for the vehicles. So what we can do is that we try to change the wired transmission to wireless transmission. So for the transmission or the linkage of the cells, they can be done in a wireless manner. So we can reduce the weight, and we don't need to worry about the use of the wires. And Now a vehicle can carry large numbers of data, including the data from cells and sensors and all of the information. Also, we have higher demand for informatics, so or infotainment. So that's why, in the future, when the cars are electrified, we would try to get rid of the wires. How can we reduce the use of wires and make it wireless? That would be another challenge. Also, the ADAS. Or semi-assistive, since we have radars and lidars and also sensors that can help us achieve ADAS. So the chips are critically important when it comes to the sensors. Or we try to support a system. We want to combine、uh, of the sensing capabilities together so that、uh, V to V or V to people, we can see whether the object is dynamic or static. When it comes to the decision making, we need the chips to help us make such kind of decision. So we talk about infotainment and cluster. We do see more and more smart infotainment, and also smart cabin. It will be very different from what we have now. When we drive, when the driver sits inside. They not only want to have the steering wheel and a central control system; they want to see more information on the dashboard. So the images, the sounds, monitoring, and also how can we drive the cars safer to get more information. In the meantime, we need to ensure safety. All these will be the challenges that we have to overcome from the perspective of the chips, and there are indeed great opportunities. As for electronics and lighting, we see the lights in the front and the back of the car. Now they were using LED lights. We do see the change in the lightings, and also when you're turning the direction, or the tail light or the headlight, all these changes. Also the control of the motors and the sensing for the.、Uh, Changing of the direction, we all need the help of the chips. So, from the perspective of the chips, now in one EV there may be like one to two hundred chips for the fuel cars, but for the future EVs, maybe we need one or two thousand chips in the EV in the future. So, by twenty thirty, if we want to have fifty million EVs in the market times one thousand chips, so that may be. Fifty or sixty billion chips in the future, so that may account for a large percentage of the、um, semiconductor. There will be huge quantity units. So in the future, just the EV industry, it will present huge business opportunities for the semiconductor industry. So this is just my overview. If we look at the、uh, EV market from the chips perspective, then we do see the great challenge. So when it comes to hybrid or electric vehicles, if we want to turn from fuel vehicles to EV or HEV, what are the trends? The first one is by twenty fifty, by twenty twenty five, thirty or forty percent of the vehicles will be EVs or hybrid EVs. By twenty thirty, it will become fifty to sixty percent, depending on the overall support of the semiconductor industry and also the development of cells. Whether there are enough cells around the world to support the development of EVs, so this is also another area of concern. People are also anxious about charging time. The charging time now is too long, so now we are trying to increase the charging from 400 V to 800 V. So if we increase the voltage, we can charge faster. 
So as mentioned by our previous speakers, some of the Taiwanese clients they're moving towards this direction. They want to support faster charging to meet the demand of the future of the EV. So many Taiwanese companies are working on that. Also, we have the wireless battery monitoring. We want to reduce the uh, weight or the burden for transmission, also from the engine to the charging inverter from the motors. ICE. Now we have the motor-driven vehicles. We do see a lot of changes. So how can we change from AC to DC so that we can accelerate the motor? But we need to have stable output. All these will be the changes in the future. Not to mention the functional safety areas or gallium nitride or silicon carbide. These will be the new materials used for. Um, the future EVs. So all these are major changes that will happen. So we know that EV will drive changes, but actually under EV there are still a lot of challenges to be overcome. For example, the chips or all the areas I've mentioned. For example, like fast charging and how can we better improve the safety so that we can increase the motor efficiency. I think all these are the challenges in the areas of EV and HEV. So. For this slide, we're going to show you that from the electric perspective, we talk about the batteries and also DC, the modules. Because we need to charge the cars, we need the charging piles. And inside a car, we need to have the charging modules. And also from the control of the uh, motor, that will also be important. So the key is integration. Because all if all of these um, modules are separate if they are done piece by piece they will occupy a lot of space so we need to cooperate with our customers in Taiwan we have a lot of tier one vendors I think we can definitely have better cooperation and integration so onboard charger and charging inverter can actually be integrated and some other customers can uh, change from DC DC to um, uh, and also the motor control that can integrate the two. So depending on different customers and depending on different needs of the car makers, we can have different integration. But actually the trend is integration. Integration is the trend. So from the tier one perspective, we can have the charger, inverter, and also DC-DC modules can be better integrated in the vehicle. So this will help the uh, increase the density inside the vehicle so more space can be created to accommodate uh, the passenger or the driver or we can put in more cells inside a vehicle given the uh, space we have. So this is how we can increase the power density for the EVs by using new uh, manufacturing processes, new solutions. We can make the uh, size of the cell smaller. So these will be important trends for EV and HEV. Of course, functional safety is critically important from um, different levels. Uh, we ASIL A, B, C to D, they have different levels. So when we promote a chip solution, I think that will be a very important fundamental area. So as mentioned, under EV and HEV, we do see some changes. Now I'd like to switch gear to talk about the ADAS system. From the perspective of the chips, what will be the changes? So in the vehicle, there'll be a lot of sensors. They are there to help us to achieve um, ADAS. These sensors may have cameras. We have the radars and lidars and supersonics. So in different systems, we had different ways for integration. In the past, we have the overall MCU, sorry, correction, ECU, but now, we do see the zoning concept. So in a certain zone, this zone is responsible for the uh, radars and the supersonic sensing for a certain area. And then information is sent to a central CPU. The benefit of doing so is that because we have so much data. So TI, we have the uh, radar SOC. In the past, there may be two radars. We have the uh, processor, and now the chips can integrate the MCU and transceivers together. And now, on top of that, the wires can be embedded to the chip. So we can make it smaller in size, but we can put more sets of 
radars, and also we can have larger amounts of data. In the past, we only have the radars for the front, but now we can have the uh, radars for the whole corner or even on the side of the car. For example, if we need to avoid or to escape other vehicles, it's not just about the front and the back, but also even the left and the right, or the upper right or uh, lower left. So all these corners are important. So when we receive larger amounts of data, we need to have faster computation speed. With a rising number amount of data, then they're distributed to different areas, and then information can be concentrated and sent back to the central control unit. So we have seen different um, sensors around the car to complete the solution. So from uh, TI's perspective, we provide the radar SOC, but in the meantime, we also provide high-speed transmission. After computing the data for sensing, it needs high-speed transmission so that the data can be sent to the um, center so that the driver can see the information. So it's not just about changing the sensors. We also need to improve the data transmission. So all of the sensor modules become smaller and smaller because now we need to put more modules, sensing modules around the vehicle. So size does matter. So we're looking at not just the sensing and transmission, but also the design of the power, also the uh, peripheral component parts, they will all become smaller and smaller. So that is from the perspective of the chip. We do see these challenges, um, changes happening. And TI can provide such solutions from the sensor chips to the powers to the transmission. We hope that by improving our chips, we can effect changes for our chips. I also want to talk about the infotainment and cluster systems. So we see that when the drivers or the passengers are sitting in a car, they can see the system. When we sit down, what do we see? In the past, we saw the screen, but now we can see the dashboard. In front of the passenger, there were no screens in the front, but now there will be a screen in front of the passenger. So this will become the trend in the future. So we see, well, the screen may become black. So the liability, reliability of the chips is important. So when it comes to the smart cockpit or the infotainment system, it includes different elements, for example, the dashboard or the stereo system or the surrounding sound or when you're driving you need to have good sensing system. Maybe when the driver is dozing off or when they're like looking around, an alarm should be triggered. We also want to see greater interaction, maybe for some gestures, some car makers uh, may include the gesture as an order to have more interaction between the driver and the vehicle. So inside the cockpit, we do see greater innovation. And also the car makers want to bring some changes. Another trend is that now drivers do not just drive. We want the passengers or the driver to enjoy videos from Netflix or they can enjoy gaming when they're in a car. So we do see greater changes in a cockpit. So the chips required to um, change the cockpit will be more. So all I talk about the V2X, how can different vehicles communicate with each other so that we can avoid collision. And uh, the final area is about lighting and body electronics. For example, the headlight, well, I think the basic function will be that the headlight can change its direction. Also, the DLP technology under TI, that is we use the mirror to change uh, the source of the light. We need to see the areas that we want to see. So from the headlights to the taillight, also the mirrors, 
they have become electrified. So uh, the mirror is actually a camera, so it can help us monitor, and it can be displayed on a screen. And also, when it comes to sensing, inside a cockpit, we may have the detection of、uh, vital signs. If the driver Life is, dang- is, is endangered. Maybe we can trigger an alarm to ask for help. So, inside a cockpit, we can build in some sensors. So, all these will be the possible changes for the future. So, my conclusion from the perspective of chips. TI can envision the changes in the next decade. First, the overall demand for chips will rise significantly. Second, facing these changes, we will try to provide our ability to over- overcome these challenges. Whether it's in the cost, we want to reduce the cost. We want the EVs to become affordable. Whether it's EV, HEV, or smart integration vehicles, and Regarding the time to market design, from the perspective of the system, we hope that from tier one to car OEM, we can shorten the time to market and to speed up design. So there are four ways. The first one is EV and HEV, from charging to motor controls, also ADAS. TI have all these solutions. We have sensing, radar, and also power and interface, and also body electronics control. That is the power for the cars, the lights, the headlights, and the tail light, and also cockpit controls. And finally, in terms of infotainment, we want to have a smart cockpit. Chips can play a very important role in all these areas. So that concludes my presentation. So, from a perspective of the chips, we do see great challenges. What TI wants to do is that through semiconductor, we can bring about these challenges and overcome the problems. So, the future EVs will be in our lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. And we would like to thank you all for joining us today. And very soon we'll be heading into the fourth topic of、uh, today's forum. After hearing about、um, Jasper Chen's presentation on exploring key trends in vehicle electrification,、um, next we would like to invite the next speaker, Jay Shen, managing director of the automotive OEM Garmin Asia. He will talk about the era of intelligent vehicle. Let's welcome him. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I will share. With you, intelligent cabin, and how Garmin is the tier one supplier of intelligent cabin applications. However, my scope of presentation will be slightly wider.、Um, so I will now begin with my presentation. I my first job was with、uh, Ford. I've been in this field for actually over 25 years. I then entered the IC. T industry. I joined I, one、uh, cell phone company, a telecom company, and eventually I ended up with Garmin. So I do feel like、uh, my life has come a full circle. I have been able to bring all the important elements that I have、uh, learned and all the lessons that I have picked up along the way、uh, to my new position at Garmin in terms of intelligent vehicle and the next generation smart cabin. I will talk about revolution of vehicle driven by technology paradigm shift. 
I will also talk about the restructuring of supply chain, driven by software-defined vehicles. So, what are the impacts of the software-defined vehicles? How that's going to change the nature of cars in general? How that's going to impact the supply chain and the suppliers? And third, I will talk about data monetization triggered by smart cabin user experience. I will talk about the trends and the services in the regard. I will also touch upon how. Uh, the different enterprises are monetizing data uh, through the smart cabin user experience. In Taiwan, in terms of EV, um, uh, Tesla accounts for 85% of the EV market. I used to drive in BMW after uh, Tesla made inroads into Taiwan. I bought a Model 3 Tesla. Uh, it, was, um, it was a path of uh, no return. Uh, once you switch to electric vehicle, it's very hard for you to go back. It's like once you start using a smartphone, you can never go back to traditional um, phones. And I just recently purchased the latest model of Tesla the other day. And I'm not trying to market Tesla new models. Uh, the point of sharing my personal story is to show you how this market is fastly transforming and growing, using myself as an example. So when, he, when we talk about um, EVs, I think we can look at the, the balance sheet of Tesla. In its, um, its a quarterly uh, balance sheet, it talks about uh, FSD, autonomous driving. So Tesla always talks about in its quarter report uh, the latest development of autonomous driving, being able to read the traffic light, and the uh, the OTAs. What are the OTA enhancements? For example, when you use the signal lights, the side cameras would then turn on automatically and synchronously, uh, and also. Sometimes when you use the onboard entertainment system, how that's linked with the online system. And it also tells you about the improvements to the car's appearance and the structure, the latest materials used to make the car's body, the latest updates, and the driving range improvement, battery improvements, just to name a few. So each quarter, uh, there are updates in these, th in these three areas. Uh, number one is software. And the second one is vehicle software. The first one is uh, autopilot and uh, full self-driving. The last one is about the car structure and the battery improvements. They, these are the main focus of uh, Tesla, uh, Tesla's uh, quarter report. There has been over 124 OT enhancements. And for Tesla, and this number itself says a lot. It does not really simply show you that all oh, the softwares were not so uh, optimal when they were first launched and they need to be optimized and upgraded all the time. Um, that's not the point that I'm, I'm going at. Um, you see that there's new patches to be downloaded. For example, now you can heat up your, your uh, driving wheel. Now you can heat up with this download. You can heat up your seat. Um, so usually the resale price of the Tesla drops by 30% once you take take it out of the dealers and then it drops another 20 percent uh, in the first year. However, with OTA enhancements, uh, the dropping of the value is actually slower. So usually when you, after you sell your vehicle, after driving it for two to three years, it's not usually not a sold at a desirable price. However, with EVs, it is a different story. You, it's a uh, aftermarket resale price can be very desirable. And for Tesla, we could see a paradigm shift as well. In the past.
test in the conventional model. Whenever you take your car back to the garage to be serviced, you're always changing the, for example, AC filters, the tires, uh, you change the battery, change the gear oil. And uh, the Tesla cars do not need to go back to the uh, garage until it has 40,000 uh, kilometers on its mileage. So take its autonomous driving as an example. In the US, we believe that when you you need to pay 8,000 NT for the autonomous driving, now the price gone up has gone up to 10,000 and uh, 12,000. Now the current price in Taiwan is, is 220,000 uh, to purchase the autonomous driving system. The more, the earlier you buy, the lower the prices. If you think that this one-time purchase is kind of pricey, you could opt for subscription. So in the U.S., if you want to go on a road trip, you could always pay an extra fee to uh, for monthly subscription. So I believe it's one one ninety nine. And T for you to be able to enjoy autonomous driving services on a monthly basis. So the Tesla's service uh, model is such that, that it's able to monetize on its services provided throughout these vehicles life cycle. So here we show you a new vehicle structure with its own OS. So will Tesla continue to lead the market? No one can say for sure. Tesla has is very has tremendous strength in manufacturing and production. What it does is it's uh, quote unquote decomposed the entire uh, ecosystem, and we see that uh, it has its own operating system. It's brought in a lot of uh, programmers, and then that's what a lot of car brands are doing. These automotive uh, manufacturers have all uh, jumped onto the bandwagon. For example, all these manufacturers shown on the screen are developing their own operating systems. So next, I would like to show you uh, the future of a uh, software defined vehicles. Maybe I should jump to the conclusion first. We know that the automotive industry is extremely innovative. In the era of computers and cell phones when smartphones were just launched and there were different uh, operating systems. Uh, Nokia has its own unique operating system. If you've used BlackBerry phones, uh, it has its own operating system as well. It's called QNS. Uh, these operating systems are no longer in existence as we speak today. Now, you either have the iOS or you have the Android uh, operating system on your cell phones. So this is uh, the result of years of evolution. And this has happened to cell phones and computers. What about electric vehicles. Now we see a very uh, diversified scene with different car manufacturers uh, developing their own unique operating systems. Maybe in the future they will there will be a convergence and the integration of these operating systems. We do not know and we shall see. Let's see. Let's say if you uh, if you do not yet own an electric vehicle, maybe we should pay closer attention to this particular uh, slide. There's a lot of ECUs, and uh, Jasper also mentioned this. Uh, in one small vehicle, the EC, there are many, many ECUs. Uh, these are like electronic control units, and one ECU may control one function or multiple functions. They are all interconnected, uh, and they talk and communicate with one another. And each ECU has its own hardware and software, and forming a highly intricate and uh, uh, complicated uh, ecosystem. When it comes to the E-Class of Mercedes-Benz, you may have up to 150 ECUs in one single car. So when Taiwanese manufacturers wanting to go into this ecosystem, uh, people ask them about their flaw rate. Let's see, because there are so many ECUs in one vehicle, when one ECU is broken, it would affect the entire network. So this is 
have a very different scenario uh, than the consumer electronics. All the ECUs have to be working properly at the same time. So now let's look at the traditional vehicle architecture and the limitations. Uh, there are a lot of components that just simply cannot be upgraded. And, and, um, and the complex architecture makes it difficult to improve vehicle performance. There's the difficulty of software update, software expansion, there are just so many physical limitations. However, in the new vehicle architecture, we have greater software scalability. So we look at the domains that are more connected. So we develop the uh, Come us centralized and simplified uh, structures. And second of all, we have high computing ability computers, chips, very chips with high performance for computing. And then all the chips are running on uh, this kind of chips. So we may have a very, very powerful chip to run the intelligent cab and another cab and another chip for autonomous driving and yet another chip uh, for uh, uploading data to the internet. There's even this newer trend where some startup companies are actually designing their own chips. So that one chip could be responsible for all the aforementioned functions. And we also want to talk about internet connection. So a Many um, many car manufacturers have their own platforms. So platform as a service is very important in this uh, under this condition. There's always a uh, software updates, data being uploaded to the platform on the cloud. So so we have the softwares here as indicated with the red frame and of course the hardware is already embedded in the car's infrastructure so this is a different approach uh, from the traditional cars so this is why we call the future software defined so simply put in the new car architecture the double e uh, components uh, we're going from uh, disintegrated uh, uh, controlling units to more centralized. However, we are looking at potentially more chips for greater computing powers. So, due to the iteration of the different generations of cars. Um, it, now today, each car might have up to 100 million lines of codes. With autonomous driving uh, on the horizon, there could be 300 million lines of code in one car in the future. And every car manufacturer is repositioning and reinventing themselves. And they're hiring more program and software uh, programmers, um, turning into tech companies. So so agile development is of paramount importance here. In the past, when you purchase one car, whether it's software or hardware, it's pretty much fixed. There's not going to be major upgrades or shifts. However, in the future, uh, the hardware, of course, is uh, embedded. However, the software through uh, OTAs continues to be enhanced. So the two are actually decoupled. So each car manufacturer will have to engage in agile development to create a very organic plan to decouple hard and software in each electric vehicle. Then, under this condition, the supply chain is consequently and then subsequently um, revolutionized. In the past, automakers, um, tier one, for example, Garmin is a tier one supplier. We used to be sort of like a tier two uh, maker. However, today we position ourselves as tier one manufacturer. So we turn around, we pick a tier two, for example, chip manufacturers to work with, therefore forming this pyramid-shaped ecosystem. Let's see, we have this uh, tier one 
uh, at the bottom. So the car makers could be Bosch. It could be any of these uh, these uh, car automakers. They need to, they only need to deal with tier one. That's the that's the status quo. However, in the future, the entire supply chain uh, has been restructured. A lot of automakers are bypassing tier one suppliers. For example, they're talking to companies like Jasper. They're talking to semiconductor manufacturers. They're talking to chip manufacturers to have discussion about the future of EVs. For example, they would have a discussion directly with, uh, with uh, for example, monitor manufacturing companies and software providers. So in the process, tier one's role is diminished. And in the process, tier two suppliers' roles are enhanced. So this is what I call a restructuring of the supply chain. Mr. Volker talked about tier 1.5. This means that um, the, the, there's a lot of uh, tier two Taiwanese suppliers uh, on their way moving towards tier one. They could uh, set their goal to be tier 1.5. So this is a very interesting interim um, area. So like I said, automakers are talking with uh, AI algorithm partners and chip partners or uh, in and of things uh, companies. So they engage in collaborative design and come up with the blue map for the next five to ten years. So in the front end design, they are already working together. In the back end, they share data and they also continue to work together. This is what we call tier 1.5. By doing this, they're bypassing tier 1. They are co-working, co-creating, and collaborating. So maybe, maybe I should elaborate this point uh, with, with this example, NVIDIA Mercedes-Benz. Uh, Qualcomm and a lot of OEM um, companies and SD Micron and uh, Volkswagen are also collaborating. Therefore, um, in fact, tier one, tier one uh, companies' solutions uh, often are determined by the automakers' uh, determination and decisions. Now, let's look at uh, Taiwan's example. So, so we can say that the, we can see that the Inolux and Taiwanese company is actually in direct contact and working with General Motors and Audi and BMW, and this trend is already uh, gaining momentum here in Taiwan. So, with the restructuring of the supply chain, let's maybe turn our focus back to the. Um, uh, in cabin experience and the data monetization. Um, as I mentioned, um, Garmin specializes in this area. I would like to share with you the trends we have observed and the trends of uh, monetizing data. So we talked about software defined experiences already. And given uh, that condition, the cabin experience will become drastically different. Take this for example. When driving an electric car, uh, people are often bothered by the fact that it, it is it is quiet, and it could be too quiet. And then for uh, the pedestrians, they are not even aware of an electric car approaching. Um, I I like the roaring sound of the engine, but the EVs simply do not provide that. And in movies such as The Fast and Furious, people keep talking about loving the sound, the roaring of the engines. So, however, with EVs, um, it's extremely quiet. When you go from one to a hundred uh, kilometers in three seconds, you're not making a sound. However, Tesla could actually add sound. For example, the BMW could actually add the sound experience to its electric vehicle driving in cabin experience. Does this sound realistic? This is an add-on that you need to pay extra for. Um, they're optimizing it. One day it will sound really realistic. For electric cars, to add this feature, you would need to spend $220. So a lot of uh, netizens 
say that in the future you just buy and you just have, you just buy an empty shell and everything else is in app purchases. Um, they people say this half jokingly. The BMW Seven Series. You can see that this in we have um, they have uh, Garmin product uh, to enhance the in cabin experience. Uh, you see that the, the screen here is 8K resolution, 31 inches of screen, almost like a theater uh, type experience. Um, it's it's connected with the Amazon Fire TV, and it's a, the ultimate in cabin experience, enabled by. Uh, Garmin products. The more screens you have, the more applications, the more infotainment options you could have. And the second aspect I want to talk about in terms of software defined experience is application ecosystem. General Motors in vehicle app ecosystem is a good example. It's encouraging the development of more apps, and then there are more and more third party apps uh, for enabling smart cabin. Lastly, in terms of software defined experience, the third aspect I want to talk about is the driving experience. Driver assist features and uh, digital dashboard, just to name a few. If you drive an, uh, a Tesla and you have paid for FSD, you know that you, you enjoy certain privileges. If, if you drive well, quote unquote, it actually gives you a mark, and then if you uh, reach a score of um, 95 uh, points for over seven days, uh, the you will be sent free downloads. So what this means is that once they confirm that you're a good driver, you get to download more apps for free. One of my friend was chatting with me recently selling that saying that no matter how hard he tries he always gets 87 points out of 100 and this is his driving report do you see this red area uh, the system determines that, that he does not keep at a safety distance from the car in front of him and he sometimes he makes tight very tight turns so Tesla determines that, that these are dangerous driving behaviors therefore he's not able to reach higher scores uh, therefore he's not given the privilege to download uh, Tesla's free uh, downloadable apps so uh, I think in the future this may be the way to go. There's um, by creating these incentives, people will be driving more safely and responsibly. Therefore, we believe that cars after the launch of smartphone will become the next uh, largest source for the generation of data. When you drive, the car actually keeps track of where you're going, your calendar, your conversation, your shopping list, your searching history, your journey from your home to your destination. Many people believe that, that their phones or their smartphones are eavesdropping on their conversations. Will the cars do the same? And once electric cars permeate the market, there will be a tremendous amount of uh, data being generated and collected. And Tesla cabin camera uh, cameras is one example. They are monitoring drivers and it, all they also collect data. They look at all these uh, cameras uh, determine whether the driver is distracted or is tired or is falling asleep. But it's not just that. Um, I hope that this is permission based. However, these cameras are also collecting to other types of data and if the data is used wisely and for a good cause um, it would benefit us all for example when you pay for car insurance you're paying somewhere between 20 to 60 thousand into dollars depending on the type of uh, insurance policy you get your coverage and your uh, driving history in the future you will we will have a usage-based insurance fee if you are a safe driver as determined by the data that had been collected through your electric cars or your um, your premium would be lowered. And what if the car, if the car detects that, that you haven't been driving for a month and you've been 
or it detects that the you your car is parked in the basement uh, or in a gated community, um, then your premium will then be lowered too. However, if you often forget to use your turn signals, um, your evaluation score will be lower, and therefore your premium will be higher for the following month. So the data can be used for a lot of good causes. However, uh, the data can also be used for other purposes as well. For example, on this road, you see that the windshield wipers are going uh, frantically, or they are going back and forth at a very fast speed. Or it could detect that uh, people are turning their high beams on. So then the cameras are actually capturing real-time weather, micro-weather patterns, and it could be then transmitted and shared with other drivers who are headed this way. And it could also be uh, sending traffic information or weather conditions uh, to you about the destination that you're headed toward. This could be sent to car drivers and motorcycle drivers as well. So Carmen is a tier one offering smart cabin uh, supplier we work with uh, BMW we offer we've been uh, supplying the screens for in cabin infotainment uh, starting uh, 2020 and it's called MGU multiple graphic units it drives it is hard that drives the intelligent cabin so um, so it's intelligent cabin to a very large extent is driven by our product and the same also applies to uh, Mercedes-Benz which is called IBI. For Ford we supply navigation uh, system and for Toyota we also we supply uh, the center console uh, for the for the in-cabin sound system and with the Yamaha motorcycles. Uh, we also supply the navigation and internet connection uh, infrastructure. In addition to intelligent smart cabin products, about two to three years ago we have been working with Mercedes-Benz to transmit the smart watches data of the driver to the car. Um, as had already been mentioned earlier, it is important to monitor the driver's uh, status quo and vital signs. Um, if you are on, if you are wearing smartwatch, the car would actually know that whether you're under stress, whether you have had any sleep the night before. The watch could also monitor your vital life signs and your health conditions, for example, for the past week. So this is something that we have developed with Mercedes-Benz. So with this MBUS system, once the driver gets into the cabin, um, the it could be um, making vaporized um, spray, putting on music, and uh, turning on the massage function of the driver's seat to help you relax, um, to enhance your uh, driving performance. We also work with um, another company where we could uh, we use the watch to open close and lock the doors with this is a collaboration with Geely and this is a product we have developed for this company now I would like to show you a video to introduce this product
use of intelligent capping, the human and the car is one. There's increasing amount of data. It comes down to and boils down to how we use the data for the greater benefits of mankind. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful sharing. So, as mentioned by our speaker, we understand that the cars in the future is just like an organism; it continues to evolve. So, the service and the application for the cabin will continue to be even better. Even the supply chain will have changes. So, for tier one and tier two suppliers, they will also learn to communicate and cooperate with each other. So. Without smooth linkage, everything will not be possible. So now, I would like to welcome our next speaker for the 5G Telecom. So we would like to welcome Shi Yiguo, President of Zhonghua Telecom, to give us his presentation on enabling smart living with smart mobility. Please. Thank you for the introduction, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be invited by Titra and Commonwealth Magazine. So I'm here to talk about enabling smart living with smart mobility. Our previous speaker did a wonderful job. Please put your hands together for the wonderful presentation by our previous speaker. Speaking of smart applications. Zhonghua Telecom. I think you're all familiar with it. We're a telecom company invested by the Ministry of Transportation and Communications. After privatization, this marks the 18th anniversary for our privatization. Over the past few years, I think 5G has played a very important role, and. It feels like 5G is invisible. So maybe for the children, you may not know about the reference I made. I think just like we can do it, we are a remote controller. We can control the robot remotely through 5G. So I'd like to thank the MC for his kind introduction. The internet is not everything, but without the internet, nothing can be done. So, through smart mobility and smart transportation, we would like to drive a beautiful digital lifestyles in the future. Well, according to the global ranking, Taiwan has always ranked among the top as the best destinations for、um, expatriates. So many foreigners, when coming to Taiwan, they really fall in love with Taiwan. I believe that people may say the warmth of our population, the beautiful scenery, are the main attractions for our foreign visitors. But I think one key attraction for foreigners to come to Taiwan is our transportation. In Taiwan, we have good transportation. Within two hours, you can go from the mountain to the ocean. Within just two short hours, or even one hour, you, you can enjoy both the mountain and the ocean. You can only see it in Taiwan. So smart transportation has led Taiwan to move ahead. So transportation plays a key role. So for the U Bike 1.0 or 2.0 version. Through our constant iter iteration, we do see that technology is driving us to move ahead. So we have the smart buses, and now the taxis are just so convenient. You bring your phone. You don't need to bring the cash. You just need to scan a QR code, and then you can pay for the fees to take the taxi to go to wherever you want to go. Our mass rapid transit system is also very convenient. We started the MRT system 20 years ago, but now in Taichung and Kaohsiung, or even the airport metro system, everything is very convenient. So from the Taiwan railways to the high-speed rail, everything is very convenient. So the convenience in transportation.
can drive us to move ahead. So we are hoping that technology can continue to push for a better lifestyle for our people. Now we're go going to loosen the quarantine trend, um, requirements. If you go abroad, where don't you want to go? From the upper left, you can imagine where you may go. If you go to a place like this, maybe if you're going to visit your customer or meet with a supplier, we have a lot of times people have overseas deployments. So at 3 p.m., they may be worried about the traffic jam. So from 3 p.m. to 6 or, or 8 p.m., you may have dinner. And then when you finish dinner, it's about 10 p.m. This is what we often see in cities that face serious traffic congestion. On the one hand, there may be too many cars. On the other hand, they may not have good public transportation. So traffic is still so congested. So in Taiwan, we can take the high-speed rail, and then we take the MRT, and then you can ride the U-bike back home. So it is very convenient to travel around in Taiwan. All these may serve as a good example for other countries if they want to develop their transportation system. Also, smart tools like the one you see on the upper right corner through the internet connection. In the future, we can make transportation even smarter. We can reduce the number of traffic accidents and we can make people safer because we know that safety is our top priority. This is the only road to take us back home. So we want to ensure traffic safety and convenience. Also on the lower left corner in the rural areas, we try to improve greater convenience and in a rural area because we know that in rural areas mostly the residents are senior citizens they have to wait for a long time at a bus station so they can wait for the bus maybe the bus would come once every one or two hours and uh, old people don't know how to check the schedule of the buses, so they may have to wait there for hours. And there may be delays along the road, so this is not convenient for the rural areas. So if we want to make the public transport smarter, if we want to provide greater convenience for the senior citizens, maybe the smart buses can go to the doorsteps of the senior citizens and take them to their destinations. So we are trying to do that. Now we are talking about universal inclusion. For telecommunications, we are talking about universal services. So the key of universality is what we would like to see. That is to say, in the M-shaped society, we hope that for those better off, Maybe we can do more to help the minorities and the disadvantaged. I think for every one of us here, this is our joint mission. We need greater warmth and we need to provide better care to the people in need. We hope that the rural areas will not be so far away from us. So what role can Zhonghua Telecom play? As mentioned by our MC, our role is the enabler of smart mobility, namely through the help of the internet and also the advanced technologies, we can help drive the smart mobility and make it a possibility. So Zhonghua Telecom is very fortunate to join a bit of 5G and it has been two years and a half since we launched the 5G services. We can provide the fastest speed to um, provide the service to the customers. We have the fixed network already. 
So on this basis, we have established the most sophisticated and fastest 5G mobile network. We have covered over 90% of rural Taiwan. So over 90% of the areas covered by 4G can enjoy 5G services. So throughout the process, through our deployment from the upper left, whether in terms of the national certification like speed test and open signal. So also our 4G network and 5G network, we have won uh, the first place around Taiwan. So over the last few years, among the NCC rankings, CHT has for years ranked top in terms of the download speed for the 4G network. I'm not just here to brag. I'm just telling you the truth. This is our responsibility and this is the honor. My company and my colleagues will try our very best to help people in Taiwan build the most important last mile, that is the mobile network. Based on our fixed network, we would like to create an environment where people can always enjoy broadband network. Wherever you go, you can enjoy mobile network. When you go back home, you can enjoy the fixed network. If there are blind spots, we can still use Wi-Fi to complement that. So the Wi-Fi can also help us complement the um, blind spot. So wherever you go, you can enjoy broadband network. So in the future, I think everyone can enjoy at least two giga of network or even hundreds of uh, gigabytes of speed. So now we are also increasing the fixed network bandwidth from 100 to 300 or even 500 uh, gigabytes. So this is what we call the mobile network, fixed network, and Wi-Fi network. The three networks, they will form a complete ecosystem. And I look forward to your suggestions and comments. My team and I will try our very best to build the most important comprehensive network for everyone in Taiwan. So if you take the MRT here, well, it's very convenient. On the lower corner, we can see the high-speed rail. On top of the cable, we drill holes so that the waves can be released. So we have the leaky coaxial cable. So when you're taking the high-speed rail, you can still receive the signals inside a car. So without affecting other people, if necessary, you can still use your phone to talk, or you can send text messages, return your emails through our network. So what we do is that you can enjoy the mobile office wherever you are. It seems that your life will be busier, but actually it's more convenient. So this kind of convenience can be enjoyed by those who need it. So I know every one of you here, you're busy, I'm busy. Well, the internet will make us busier, but it will bring great convenience to all of us. Another thing that we are trying to work on is that Like when you're taking the MRT or high-speed rail, in around Taiwan, on the lower right corner, even in the mountains, if you enjoy hiking, I believe that sometimes you may see this logo on a path. We didn't make this logo. This is created by the Forestry Bureau. They think that Chonghua Telecom has done a really good job. So they created the sign. Actually, deploying the infrastructure in the mountains 
does not bring us great profit, but we just want to bring greater convenience to our people. So next week, we will have another event. So um, please allow me, I cannot reveal too, many information, too much information, but if you go hiking, you can still enjoy good signals. So we can provide greater convenience to the public. Whether it's for commuting or hiking or tourism, I think this is our responsibility. Our Ministry of Transportation and Communication has told us that we need to provide greater convenience for transportation and communications. Now, throughout the process, what will be the blueprint for our future smart transportation development? So. I think from this morning until now, many experts have mentioned that we want to create a cyberspace. So this will be an amazing space. So our transportation will be in this amazing space. Through smart mobility, I think on the bottom layer, there will be information security. That's the foundation. On top of that, we can build the network. So it means that the network is secure. On top of the secure network, we can have the device that will be the vehicles. And then on top of it, we have the cloud and also the road. So the roads and the clouds can be connected. So on the right, you can see the roadside unit, the RSU, and also on the vehicle. So when cars are moving, we can have real-time connection. So it's always broadband connected. So CV2X, meaning everything will be connected to the internet, that is cellular vehicle to everything. So the five steps, the safety, internet, vehicle, roads, and cloud, all these elements can create an ecosystem so that we can enjoy smart transportation. You can see on the top, we have MAS and TAS. MAS means mobility as a service. So TAS means travel as a service. So let's move on to the next page. Based on the five elements, so throughout the process, Chonghua Telecom has invested heavily in ensuring network security. On the left, you can see one general manager from our information uh, office branch. He has helped the MOTC to pass the certification for uh, V2X, so he has received the award. Our vision is to ensure a new era for network safety for our vehicles so that our smart mobility industry will thrive in Taiwan so that we can set a standard and smart mobility can be applied to places around the world. We can actually export this kind of service. In Taiwan, we have a lot of smart applications, and we're hoping that with the support of Titra, we will be able to export many applications and services abroad. Titra, in the past, exported our goods and products to countries around the world. But in the future, we will be able to sell not just physical products, but also services. That includes our smart solutions for smart transportation. So smart transportation and also smart medicine, smart manufacturing, all these will be important items for export. So smart transportation is good business. Over the last two to three years, with the support of Minister Wang of MOTC, so we have the transportation technology meeting. So the transportation and communication businesses are booming. With the support of the network, 
we have seen a lot of smart venues and later I'm going to share with you in my presentation. So all these will be the areas for further efforts and collaboration. Now I'd like to move on to some cases. The first I will talk about a car flow smart solution. As mentioned before, through 5G and ABC technology. So A means AI. It means AR and VR. So they are under the roof of A. So AI image recognition can help us understand that when you receive the car flow information, we can use the big data to analyze the types of the cars, the directions. So through big data and long-term analytics, we can know at which time, at which place, when we will have larger car flows. So just like now, you can use Google Map. When do you plan to go out? Maybe from here, if you're going to drive to Taipei Main Station, how long will it take? Then if you use Google Map, you will know how long it will take. So this will help our people to improve their safety. Also, when the government is managing the transportation, the data will be extremely helpful. So in the past, on the right corner, you can see the real-time control for traffic lights. If you remember, if we have special demand, like high-ranking officials going there, should we ensure that there will be green light all the way? In the past, we have to send out a lot of police officers, but in the future, we don't have to do that. But we can control the traffic lights to ensure that these high-ranking officials can pass the highway without being stopped by the red light. Or for example, sometimes when you travel, you may find that you have to stop there waiting for the red light to go green. But you would just stay there like for 30 seconds or one minute. It may take a long time. What does it mean? It means a lot of carbon emissions. Without fully electrifying our vehicles, the carbon emissions at these roads or crossroads can be actually reduced through smart traffic lights. And I think this is something we can improve. So this is one case. We can use this to address traffic congestion. We can remind drivers that maybe you should not avoid going out during this congested period. We can also remind people to reduce their uh, fuel consumption or carbon emissions. So this will be conducive to the environment. Now let's move on to case number two, smart solution for roadside parking space. I mean, environment and sustainability have become the most important topics for the world. If you go to the highway, there may be some resting stations. If there are too many cars, you have to circle around to find a parking place. So I think starting from the roadside parking, in the future, our freeway administration will try to uh, come up with some solutions. Because if we can have the smart solution for roadside parking, we can reduce carbon emissions and definitely we're still working in this area. So through the earth magnetic sensor and with the help of the sensor, when you go out, you can pay and then we can use the sensors to know how many cars uh, are in the parking lot. So I think this will all help the roadside parking space, space smarter. And case number three is the AI monitoring technology. Monitoring technology is a very important area for Zhonghua Telecom. We have assisted the city and county government. So you can see Taoyuan, Kaohsiung, New Taipei City, and Xinzhu County. All these local government have been working with us. They want us to help with the monitoring technology. The first one is that we can reduce the occurrence of traffic accidents, especially if we see the loss of property or even worse, the loss of lives. We know that a lot of families are broken because of the traffic accidents. So the whole family may have to suffer from the tragedy. So people may say, oh, I grew up without my father or mother. You, 
know that love from parents means the world to the children. So if we can reduce the occurrence of tragedies, then we believe that this can be done through our smart solution. So at the corner of the road, we can use the alarm system to remind people. And also now people are using their phone when crossing the road. People may not pay attention to the traffic. So the alarm system at the crossroad. Can be done through greater AI image recognition, and with the help of AI, we can ensure greater safety. And also, through the help of AI monitoring technology, we can better protect our people. Another advantage of AI monitoring technology is that if we install the monitoring technology on a road, we know that we have to show a sign saying that. Well, we have a camera, or we have a CCTV over here. We know that Taiwan is a democracy. We need to warn people that hey, we have a camera here. Please pay attention. If you violate the law, you will be fined. But if you put the sign here, so for this period of time, we do see the reduction of accidents. So. Even for some areas, we do see a reduction of sixty percent of accidents in this area. So we know that accidents mean not just the loss of property, but also the loss of lives. So, with this kind of deployment, maybe for some concerns, without installing the CCTV, but actually we can just put a sign telling that well, well there's a camera. It is a good reminder. So, for example, you have an elephant chained to、um, a pole. If you release, or like if you just、uh, take away the chain, maybe the elephant will still be there because this shows that people become more compliant with the law. So, one day, if you just put a sign, well, if you remove the sign, will people violate the law? No, because the sign has been there for a long time because people know that there's a CCTV. So people don't want to violate the law. So if we know that there is monitoring technology, why don't we change our behavior? So I think, from the behavior side, technology can help us change our behavior. I think this is certainly worth doing, worth trying. So, from this perspective, I think what we do is extremely meaningful. So that is how we can use AI monitoring technology to improve safety. So that's why city and county governments are approaching us. They say, "Zhonghua Telecom, let's do it together. We want Zhonghua Telecom to help us deploy the CCTVs or technology because it means that we need to improve the protection of property and lives, and we want to provide greater convenience for our people." And case number four. We have the emergency signals for cars and for buses. With the V two X technology, so we talk about the five elements. Well, these are internet safety, vehicle, roads, and cloud. If accidents do happen, and we have a patient, we have a victim. If we want to call the ambulance. When the ambulance arrives, once the ambulance arrive on a spot, when people care are put into the、um, ambulance, then the car is just like a cyberspace. The EMT may perform、um, some emergency rescue for the patient, for example, by collecting the data. So through 5G. Data collection. The data can be sent to the ER. So when the ambulance receives the information, then the doctor in the ER receives the information as well. So when the patient is in the ambulance, the ER doctors will be standing by in the ER. They can ensure or they can understand the situation of the patient. So. In addition to the on-site care from the EMT, we can also enjoy the benefit of remote medicine from the ER doctors. So we know what kind of actions should be taken. So this way, because of this one minute, even before the arrival of the ER, the lives can be saved. 
We know that life means more important than anything. No matter what religions you believe in, saving lives means the most important thing. So that's why I need to introduce this solution or this case because this is extremely valuable. Think about that. We have heard a lot of cases saying that I'm just so grateful this doctor saved my life. Just one minute away, I may be gone. And the doctor may say, "If you're here one minute later, you may die." We have heard so many stories like this. So if we can use this kind of smart transportation technologies to help us when tragedies happen, but actually there are many kinds of stories. Although we know that some unfortunate things happen, but no life is lost. So. We can still ensure the integrity of a family, so this is extremely important. So every second count when it comes to accidents. So whether it's for ambulance, they have the priority to go. I think this is also a very important area. So we want to ensure that the ambulance can arrive at a hospital as soon as possible. So we talk about the five elements: internet, safety, vehicle, roads, and cloud. When they,、uh, when the ambulance wants to pass, we want to give priority to the ambulance. We have one user case in Tainan City Government. So. Along the road, we want to ensure that the ambulance can reach the hospital within the shortest period of time. We can reduce carbon emissions. I think this is a very concrete example. So, in this way, we can ensure that the ambulance can go faster. People don't need to wait so long for the buses. We can reduce carbon emissions. All these are the evidence. And. We have been repeating all these elements. We want to reduce CO2 emissions. We want to save people's lives, and we want to ensure safety and also convenient transportation. And case number five is smart e-bus. Around Taiwan, you can see several venues. So this one is in Danshui, or we have another one in Taichung and Zhanghua, or in Tainan. We have a lot of、uh, venues to test the e-buses, or even in the science parks, we have the driverless e-buses circling around the venue. It will give us greater convenience in the future. Once we save the labor, then they can、uh, do. Other high-value-adding matters. So, machine can become our great help. Machines are not there to take over our jobs, but we can free、um, humans from these boring and repeating jobs. So,、uh, we can leave them to machines. And also, just recently. Uh, this is the president for our IT department. He received the Smart City Outstanding Contribution Awards. So he led our IT teams to create the smart transportation 5G solutions for our vehicles. So the integration、uh, smart solutions for、uh, vehicles, road, and cloud. The MOTC、uh, tried to recognize their achievement. So we received awards. So. Now let's move on to the future vision for smart mobility. I think our previous speaker just mentioned that、um, he said something extremely well. Then that was a really good video. That will be the metaverse for the future. In a moving vehicle, you can do whatever you want because. With the help of the internet, with smart transportation, everything is possible. So let's look at the evolution of mobile communications. I think 5G has three features: high speed. So we started from megabytes of、uh, speed. Now we have gigabytes of speed and low latency. Now we know it's not just about seconds; it's about milliseconds. So every millisecond counts, or the latency is within just one or two milliseconds. When you listen to music or when you watch videos, you can see that it's running simultaneously. About two months ago, we held several immersive uh, performance. Uh, 
represented where the performers are at different locations. For example, uh, one performing group is in the a National Concert Hall, whereas another group of performers are in New Taipei City. So we can enjoy the performance all together. And on the screen, we can see Jingguan Shi, a very beautiful sight. So performers on both locations can coordinate and perform together. That was just one example. We have held dozens of concerts or performances like that where performers are on different locations. So that's the uh, beauty from low latency. And the third feature is great connection. In the past, we talked about the connectivity for people. But now, with the help of 5G, so connectivity is even better. So we talk about everything is connected to the internet because it is already a reality so now we're talking about 6g in the future so from low orbit to um, the satellite so from low orbit to uh, satellite I don't think that will replace the mobile network on the ground now the mobile network has reached gigabytes maybe in the future we will reach 10g or even higher so the satellite on the sky well, they can have 100 megabytes of speed. In 10 years, how far will it go? We don't know. But it's a satellite far away in the sky. So the advancement is not as rapid as the uh, network on the ground. So probably for the low orbit satellite, maybe they can play some role in the future. But in any case, for the technology now, we don't think that they will be able to replace the um, ground network. If you're already used to this kind of network, but if we ask you to go back to the dial-in network for the 3G period, I don't think that's acceptable to you. Then no one wanted to go back to um, that kind of speed. So we believe that in the future, it will become a 3D network from the ocean to the land, to the sky, to the air. Everything will be connected. So it will become a always broadband connecting seamless ecosystem. So from 1996 to 2015, that was the period for telematics. From 2016 to 2020, we call it as the intelligent connected vehicle period. But after 2020, with the advent of 5G, now we have entered a phase of smart mobility. So from the driving machine to digital devices, now we have the, now we think that this is a lifestyle space. So in the car, in a vehicle, Whatever you want to do, it's not about technology, it's about your imagination. So in a vehicle, you can work, you can take out your cell phone, can you sing, can you play mahjong? Can you sing with people from a different location? It's up to your imagination, the sky is the limit. So smart mobility is happening now. So our previous speaker gave us a wonderful presentation. Whatever you want to do in a vehicle, it's up to you. What do you want to do in this space? How big is it? It depends on the inside of a car because the self, the driverless, um, self-driving cars doesn't require a driver. So whatever you want to do, it's up to you. It's up to your imagination. You can do everything in a vehicle. So in this space, you can include entertainment and home space. It can be a living room from your car. It can become an extension of your office. So it's all up to you. So finally, we'll talk about VAS, vehicle as a service. So inside this vehicle, what can you do? It's up to you. So finally, um, air taxis. I think it will happen very soon. So due to time constraint, I'll just skip a few slides. So many 
telecom companies and multinationals are trying to work on that. I believe that in Taiwan, we have wonderful companies. As long as we can design the product, I believe that the device will definitely be created. So maybe it's a drone or like unmanned vehicle or like unmanned um, ve whatever it is. People can sit inside, but we don't need a people as a drive a person as a driver sitting inside. I believe that we will see this kind of product in the future. So finally, challenge and response. I think the biggest challenge and the most important topic is information security. So that's why we talk about the fact that in Taiwan, Zhonghua Telecom attaches great importance to security. We follow the international standards and we try to ensure security for our network, whether it's in vehicle or outside a vehicle. So we talk about the five elements in the ecosystem, internet safety, vehicle, roads, and cloud. We want to ensure your safety. So from the top, we have TAS and MAS, travel as a service, under which we have the mobility as a service so whether you're taking the MRT high-speed rail Taiwan rail taxi or buses everything can be connected so that you can enjoy smooth travels in the bottom you can see green energy so all of the devices will be powered by the green energy. So we need the cells, the electronics, and also power control, and also the charging station, energy storage. I think in the morning, our speakers have touched upon smart grid. I think all of these topics are integrated together. We also joined a smart grid deployment from TPC. We call it DREAMS. This is a DREAMS project. We want to have efficient energy management system. We can have good distribution and dispatch to better understand the energy usage. So my finally, throughout the process, I want to share with you four ABCs. On the bottom, we want to work with all of the outstanding partners from Taiwan or from all over the world. You're welcome to join Zhonghua Telecom. On the bottom, ABC, we need to have the right attitude, behavior, and competence so that we can achieve all of these smart solutions that include smart mobility. So that's the bottom. That's the most important thing. With this layer, on top of it, we can have the second layer of ABC on the right. That is always broadband connected. So the second ABC. It means that Zhonghua Telecom is very strong in this area. And when you invite us to give a talk, we just want to show you what we can do. Once again, thank you for your support. So through this open network that is always broadband connected, this is our strength. But on top of it, we have another layer of ABC that is on the left, open platform. So through another layer of ABC that is AI, big data, and cloud cybersecurity. So on the left, that's another layer of ABCs. We want to build a platform. So the final layer of ABC on the top is that because we want to serve our clients, we need to know our customers, we need to know their demands. So we have customers from the government, from the companies, from the consumers, individuals, and households. So Zhonghua Telecom will try to work with other people. So we try to build partnerships. We would like to collaborate with various partners. If you would like to work with us, you're always welcome. We can acquire the companies which would like to join us. So through these four layers of ABCs, we would like to build these solutions to serve our customers. So with 5G and the four layers of ABCs that may create our openness, empowerment, and value co-creation mission. 
So these will be uh, the values in all aspects. So once again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. We hope that I really like the slogan. So once again, I want to share with you, this is the slogan I would like to enjoy. We hope that you will enjoy a prosperous future with Zhonghua Telecom. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Kuo from Zhonghua Telecom for joining us this afternoon. Now we would like to invite all the speakers in the afternoon to please go on stage for group photo shooting. We would like to welcome our speakers from Garmin, from all the um, companies represented at this forum, Mosaic Venture Lab, Texas Instruments, Garmin, and Chonghua Telecom. Uh, we would like to remind you to please fill in the uh, participant satisfaction questionnaire to provide your feedback to us. Your feedback is extremely valuable because it helps us improve our future events. So make sure you fill in the questionnaire and provide your feedback to us. May I also remind you to please take all your personal belongings with you as you leave the conference room. With that, we conclude the e-mobility forum 2022 we would like to thank all the speakers for their participation in and contribution to the forum once again we thank all our audience members joining us in person and online thank you for joining us please take care and we hope to see you soon